All right, y'all. It's finally time. Commander Legends Battles for Boulder Gate. Full set review. It's going to be the longest episode I've ever done. I'm talking about over 100 cards in this episode. I'm going to be talking about every single rare in the whole set and Commander decks, uh, as well as anything else I feel like is notable and common or uncommon. Uh, I'm going to start with the regular set and then move into the Commander decks. Uh, and yeah, if you this is just the regular set. Uh, these are all non-Commander cards. Uh, if you'd like to see my commander uh, review, my reviews of the commanders, uh, I have two different episodes. One's for the uh, backgrounds and commanders you can pair with the backgrounds, and the other one is for the multicolor standalone commanders. So if you'd like to see either of those videos, they'll be in the description. Uh, yep, let's just go ahead and get into, get into it. This one's going to take a while. Uh, don't forget to hit like, comment, subscribe, do all the algorithm stuff. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on this video, uh, so I'd appreciate if y'all uh, did that for me. Uh, so yep. No more bullshit. Let's get into it. <clears throat> First up, uh, we got a cycle of these. These are uh, the ancient dragons. Uh, there's one for each color. Each one of them uh, flies is an elder dragon. And then when it hits a player, you get an effect uh, based on the number you roll on a d20. Uh, so I probably won't read every single one of them, but that's what they do. Uh, this is the white one. It's ancient gold dragon. It's five white white uh, elder dragon flying seven ten. Whenever Ancient Gold Dragon deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20. You create a number of 1-1 blue fairy dragon creature tokens with flying equal to the result. Um, this one definitely isn't the worst one, um, but it's definitely not the best one. I do think people will underrate getting uh, a ton of 1-1 flyers. Um, that's actually a pretty powerful effect in white, especially since you're going to, uh, in like any sort of tokens or go wide deck, um, that's going to like anthem all those creatures or trigger Car Cathar's Crusade a million times, all that stuff, so... I don't think this one's the best, but it's not the worst. Uh, seven mana is a lot for this effect, uh, and you're in white, so you probably want to pair it with like another color to be able to reliably give this haste. Like all of them, you want to try to give them all haste. Um, so, yeah, this one's good. It's just fine, though. Uh, next up, uh, Archivist of Ogma. Uh, one in a white for a 2-2, Halfling Cleric. It has Flash. Whenever an opponent searches their library, you gain one life and draw a card. Uh, this is uh, Wizards of the Coast attempt to uh, buff white because uh, everybody's been complaining about white for a while in Commander, even though it honestly hasn't been that bad. Uh, I made a whole video about it. Um, but yeah, this is this is them trying to fix white in Commander. And it's just, there's there's another card that goes hand in hand with this one. They're just trying to print super staples. It's like, hey kids, we heard you wanted better white cards. So then they just print like ridiculous white cards like this. This card's obviously absurd. You could realistically play it in any white deck, just like you could Smothering Tithe or any Esper Sentinel or any of the other white super staples that exist now. Um, yep, yeah, not much explanation needed. This card's insane. Um, it goes best in like uh, any sort of like um, uh, low CMC reanimator decks, uh, which I talked about a lot in my, a, a lot in my white uh, review uh, of Commander. Um, yeah, uh, this card's insane. Uh, ascend to Avernus, X white, 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 sorcery. Return all creature and planeswalker cards with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Exile ascend from Avernus. Um, we've had effects similar to this uh, for a while, uh, but never have they been worded in this way. Usually there are two mana X and you get to return a creature of a particular CMC uh, to the battlefield. Uh, Rally the Ancestors comes to mind. Um, but this one lets you get all of them that are X or less, and it gets Planeswalkers, which I don't think is that big of upside, but it's nice to have. Um, so yeah, having said that, I think this card is actually very good. Um, and I think some people will sleep on it because it doesn't look impressive. Uh, it reads like a lot of the other cards that haven't been impressive in the past, but this one definitely has, uh, the right extra words on it, uh, to make it good. So, uh, this card's great. Try it out. Uh, Battle Angels of Tyr, two white white for a 4-4 Angel Knight, flying in Myriad. Uh, so quick note, it doesn't say what Myriad here is, but Myriad basically is uh, whenever you attack a player, you get to create a token copy of this uh, that attacks each other player, and then the tokens go away at the end of combat. Um, so what does this say? Whenever this deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. If that player has more cards in hand than each other player, then you create a treasure token. If a player controls more lands than each other player, then you gain three life if that player has more life than each other player. Um, so if you watch my uh, legendary set review, especially the backgrounds, because there's a cycle of backgrounds that do a similar effect to this, <clears throat> the, uh, 
The problem with those backgrounds is that they force your commander to do the attack, uh, and they also force you to attack a certain player with that commander. Um, this one you can attack anybody, whoever the actual this actual card can get in on, because who cares if the angels get blocked or die, right? Um, you'll be getting some value out of this every combat, probably. Usually you'll get, I would say probably on average, you could expect to get two of these effects. Um, as soon as this is like drawn a card and made a treasure, you're feeling like amazing about this card. Um, if this sticks on the board for very long, you're going to accrue quite a bit of advantage, whether it's mana, cards in hand, or life. So um, this card's pretty good. Uh, I would recommend putting this uh, e in something that cares about either the creature types or... Um, you know the tokens aspect of it but realistically uh similar to uh the other white card uh this one you could put in any deck but i would want a little bit more this one's not quite as it's not quite as obscene as the other white card this one's just like a fine beater and then if you can you know uh upgrade it in any way make it synergize with your deck a little better then um then you can be pretty happy with it uh next up contraband livestock one in a white for an instant uh exile target creature then roll d20 uh, based on your result, you give them a token. Uh, if you get 1 through 9, they get a 4-4 four, four green ox. Uh, if it's 10 through 19, they get a 2-2 two, two green boar. And then if it's a 20, you give them a 0-1 white goat. Um, honestly, this this could say give them a 30-30, and it probably wouldn't really matter. Um, all these creatures are like kind of irrelevant. The main thing is that you exile the problem uh, for 2 mana on an instant. That's a pretty good rate. Um Realistically, we have better cards than this. Uh, Path to Exile, Swords to Plowshares. I'd say Generous Gift, I'd probably play over this. Um, White has a lot of options, but this is another nice one, especially for budget players. Um, don't forget about this one. This one's good. It's definitely better than the... Um, oh, what's the three-mana one that gives them a 1-1 one -one changeling? I don't remember what that one's called off the top of my head, but this is definitely better than that card because um, it's one less mana, and uh, you don't give them a creature that is likely to give them any sort of boost if they're in a tribal deck or something um so yeah this card's good uh horn of valhalla uh one in a white for an equipment uh it also has adventure but i'll read the main equipment portion first uh equip creature gets plus one plus one for each creature you control uh equip three that's a fine equipment nothing stellar though um but it pairs really well with the adventure which is uh yisgard's call uh x white white for a sorcery adventure uh, create X11 white soldier creature tokens. Uh, notably, you do have to cast the adventure side of this before the uh, main card if you want to get both. If you just cast the main card, you can't go back and cast the adventure um, just for newer players. Uh, but yeah, this card's pretty great. Um, it uh, get allows you to go kind of wide on tokens, and then it gives you an equipment that pays you off for having those tokens, and it can turn any of those tokens into a pretty big threat. Um, so this is just good for a uh, go wide white tokens deck, similar to what we were talking about with the uh, with the battle angel. Um, solid card. Lizelle's acrobatics three and a white for an instant. Exile all non-token creatures you control, then roll a d20. Uh, one through nine, return those creatures to the battlefield under those owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So you flicker your whole board. Um, return those creatures to the battlefield uh, 10 through 20 return those creatures to the battlefield under their owner's control then exile them again turn those creatures to the battlefield under their owner's control at the beginning of the next end step uh so that second ability is worded really weird but it just allows you to flicker them it, it double flickers them it flickers them out back in and out instantly and then they come back on the end step like the previous mode does um this card's like fine you got a 50 50 shot if this card always did the second mode then it would be pretty decent um only decent though so having said that the first mode is kind of eh being an instance nice, but um, this does save exactly... This saves your creatures from a board wipe. You're exactly non-token creatures, but um, I don't know. I would really want this in a flicker deck, like something playing like Yorion and those sort of stuff that wants to flick your whole board repeatedly. Um, but I would only really be in for this card if I always hit a 10 through 20. I'd rather this be on an actual creature that flickers stuff, so that way I can flicker that creature and get more flickers out of it um yeah so this one's like not really recurrable uh and you don't really get the option of flickering some things you have to exile all your non-token creatures um which can be a downside sometimes so i'm not super high on this card i don't think it's that great even for flicker decks uh legion loyalty six white white for an enchantment creatures you control have myriad 
Uh, very important wording here. It does not say non-token creatures. It just says creatures. So your tokens even make tokens, which is pretty sick. Um, eight man is like infinite mana though uh, for this effect. That being said, this is a pretty good uh, closer kind of out of nowhere because all those tokens you make from Myriad have pseudo haste um, because the creatures already existed on the battlefield and they didn't know you were going to play this card. And then all of a sudden it changes the math a ton. Um, so this card's nothing to scoff at, but, uh, I don't think it's, like, insane. Um, I don't remember where I heard it, but I heard somebody call it, like, the White Crater Hoof, some other content creator. Um, and I definitely don't think it's that. That being said, this card is, uh, still very good. Um, yeah, your tokens make tokens, your, uh, Sun Titans make tokens, all your ETB stuff that matters, uh, anything that cares about tokens will like this. Um, yeah, this is just a really good card, um. Mana is expensive, so make sure you're in the right deck where you can easily hit this mana and you care about all the extra attacks, effects, and token effects that you get from all this. Um, this is not a slam dunk in every white deck, but this is a pretty good finisher, I would say. Uh, I would say it's not like the best finisher, though. I would probably prefer something like True Conviction, which is a six mana enchantment that gives all your creatures double strike and lifelink. Um, that has a, obviously a little bit different effect than this. Um, but something like that is a card I would generally, uh, prefer to play over this one, but this card is pretty fun and splashy and, um, can, can do a lot more than true conviction in the right circumstance. Rescuer Chwinga, Ch Chwinga, I don't know, uh, <laughs> one and a white for an elemental spirit, uh, it has flash, it's a 2-2. Two -two. When it enters the battlefield, you may return another permanent you control to its owner's hand. Um, this is another white mate and lion. Uh, and not only is it a white main lion, it's an optional white main lion. Uh, you can, uh, return a permanent if you want to, um, but you don't have to. But the only thing that sucks about this, uh, that a lot of people will miss, um, is part of the power of white main lion is you can just choose itself and keep, uh, you can kind of like pseudo flicker it, um, by keep replaying it for two mana. Um, this one says specifically return another permanent you control to its owner's hand. So you can't do that trick. Um, and realistically, that's a, like that's part of the reason a lot of people play White Mane Lion. So um, sure, if you have White Mane Lion and this, you can make them like flicker each other or something. But uh, I don't know. You actually can't even do that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I've, I, I think this card's like fine. Um, but it's definitely no White Mane Lion. But the optional part is nice, even though it can't choose itself. Sculpted Sunburst, uh, three white white for sorcery. Choose a creature control, then each opponent chooses a creature they control with equal or lesser power. If you chose a creature this way, exile each creature not chosen by any player this way. Uh, this card's worded really weird, but it just amounts to a, a bad exile board wipe in my opinion. Um, Cause you, the creature that you wanna choose that you control, uh, first you have to have a creature before this board wipe does like anything. Um, then you have to choose something that you want to keep, which is probably not that likely to be that low of power, which means they can choose the thing that they actually want to keep. Uh, so yeah, I, this card just kind of sucks, especially for five mana. Realistically, if this card was like three mana, I still probably wouldn't think it's very good because the conditions are just very weird and hard to make good. Um, so yeah, being five mana, this card is just not playable in any way, I don't think. Unless you're in exactly like a wall stack where you would play, uh, you know, Fell the Mighty or whatever. Uh, then I guess this can do a similar thing. But even then, you still like lose a bunch of your shit. So uh, yeah, I think this card's just like stone unplayable. Uh, white Plume Adventure. Tuna White for an Orc Cleric. It's a 3-3. Three, three. When it enters the battlefield, you take the initiative. The beauty of each opponent's upkeep, untap a creature you control. If you've completed the dungeon, untap all creatures you control instead. Um, this is a very cheap card to uh, introduce the initiate initiative, um, which I do really like. Uh, it also untaps a creature each opponent's upkeep, which is uh, a quite a nice effect, I would say. So if you have any sort of creatures that uh, have like good tap effects or something, um, then this is uh, a nice effect to have. And then untapping your whole team, uh, Drum Bellower, I think, has turned out to be a pretty solid card in Commander. Not broken or anything, but definitely a solid card. Uh, and this can do that and give you some extra value through the initiative. Um, 
So I quite like this card. Um, it's similar to playing like, uh, you know, a slightly understated creature to get Monarch in the game. Uh, I would say in, in general, the initiative is like a, a bit worse than Monarch. Um, but the initiative definitely has some really nice modes on it. And it's a, a really good continuous, uh, you know, way of getting value. So uh, I do like the initiative. And uh, I do think it'll definitely play a role in your commander games in the near future. Having said that, I think this card's uh, is fine. It's pretty decent. Uh, I would say the most important thing here is that you want to care about the second mode. Introducing the initiative should be kind of just a, a gravy uh, mode on this card. Because I would play some cards that would like just say you get the monarch and they do some super small effect. I would not play a card that says you take the initiative and you don't get anything else. That doesn't seem playable to me. Uh, but this having a, a the second ability is actually a pretty nice effect even on its own. Uh, and then it gives, you know, the initiative is kind of gravy on the top here. Uh, so, yeah. Moving on, we got Windshaper Plain, Planter? Plant? I don't know. Uh, I swear I, I can say names. Uh, a four and a white for an angel. It's a 4-4 four, four with flash and flying. Uh, when it enters the battlefield during the... Uh, when it enters the battlefield during the declare attacker step. What a sentence. Or partial, part of a sentence. For each attacking creature, you may reselect which player or planeswalker that creature is attacking. Um, this is a pretty fun political card. Uh, the rate on this card is uh, not amazing. I would much prefer this if this was on like a 3-mana 2-2 two -two or something, obviously. But um, having said that, this effect can be pretty backbreaking uh, for somebody turning their team sideways. Um Notably, you can't, like, goad them. You can't, like, make the creatures that aren't attacking attack. It only lets you reselect the attacking creatures. Um, but that being said, you can make all their creatures run into the creatures that can block, uh, whether that's your creatures or your other opponent's creatures. Um, but, yeah. Or you can make their attack really beneficial. Um, if they're, like, alpha striking you, you can instead make them, uh, you know, take out another opponent or kill their planeswalker or whatever. Um so this card is uh, not great, but uh, it's a really cool effect, and uh, this can definitely blow people out for sure. Uh, so if that's the kind of moments you live for in Commander, then you'll enjoy this card. Your temple is under attack. We got a common here. Uh, two and a white for an instant. Choose one. Uh, creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. Uh, or you and target opponent each draw two cards. Um, I quite like this uh, card. There's a lot of... Um, Usually, there's a lot of decks that don't want to play like just flawless maneuver into fairy's protection, uh, and for those decks, um, you'll take as many of these effects as you can get, and this definitely replaces like unbreakable formation and some of those other three mana indestructible effects, um, because this also has the upside of uh, you know when you have nothing better to do and this card's sitting in your hand when you have no board or you draw it late game and have no board, you can at least you know uh, draw some cards off of it. Sure, you have to give your opponent some cards, but uh, I, I'm, I'm borderline, I borderline say secret rendezvous playable. Um, so yeah, being the fact that this one's an instant though, so you can play it on like the turn before you're about to untap. So your opponents, the opponent that you give the cards to probably can't do anything with them until their turn. Uh, yeah, all that being said, I think, I think the first mode is why I'm playing this card, but the second mode is definitely, uh, nice to have there for sure. Uh, it definitely makes it better than unbreakable formation and the other, uh, rootborn defenses, the one that populates and gives you indestructible. Um, outside of niche scenarios, uh, for those two other cards, I would play this one in most other uh, scenarios. All right, we're moving on to the blue cards. Uh, remember, this is just the main set. We're going to talk about the commander deck cards uh, all together uh, closer to the end. Um, so Ancient Silver Dragon. This is the blue dragon. Uh, it's six blue blue. It's an 8-8. Eight, eight, and this one draws you cards uh, based on the, the die roll that you get for the, from the D20. And then also gives you no max hand size. Um You'll hear me talk about this a lot, but generally I don't think no max hand size is like a, a valuable effect. Um, but when you're drawing as many cards all at once with this card, uh, and it may not be... If you give this thing haste, which is what you want to ideally do, it's unlikely that you'll be able to play any of those cards. So on this card specifically, I think the no max hand size is uh, is nice. Um, but yeah, this card is uh, definitely has uh, the most powerful effect out of all of them. But being 8 mana and being in blue means that you really want to pair it with a color that can give it haste, uh, being like red or whatever. Um, so yeah, and 8 mana is just a lot of mana for this card. You should draw a ton of cards off this for the mana cost you're paying. Um, so yeah, I think this one is uh, above average. This is probably like number 2 on the list. Uh, I would say the white dragon is probably number 3. 
uh, out of the five. Um, but yeah, this one's just like fine. It's it's good, obviously, but it's like fine. This one's pretty situational, though, because the mana cost is so intensive. Bane's Contingency. One blue, blue for an instant. Counter target spell. If that spell targets a commander you control, instead counter that spell, scry two, then draw a card. Uh, I wanted to talk about this card because I anticipate seeing this a decent amount. I think people will think this card's good, uh, but I am quite against this card. Uh, I almost never reach to three mana counter spells. Uh, unless they are like guaranteed extremely flexible or have some sort of pretty significant advantage over like straight up counter spell or arcane denial or delay or like any of the myriad of two mana mana spells that uh you know counter your opponent's spell just straight up i'd even play like negate and other stuff like that over this um a card that i would rather play over this that's actually a reprint in the set uh is dream fracture which is the same mana cost it counters any spell uh, and then you and the uh, opponent that you counted the spell from each draw a card. Uh, sure, they get their card back, but the more important thing is you get your card back. Um, trading one for one is uh, definitely not ideal in Commander. So anytime you can kind of negate that, even if you give one opponent, you know, the same uh, the same advantage as you have, aka you both get your card back, uh, I would much rather have that effect than this effect. Uh, situational very very situational uh you know card draw on a cancel so uh, i'm completely off this card i will never play this card uh and i don't think you should either displacer kitten three and a blue for a cat beast uh it's a two two uh whenever you cast a non-creature spell exile up to one target non-land permanent you control then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control uh this card is insane this card seems very easy to go infinite with uh I'm sure if I spent like, you know, 10 minutes, I could probably think of like three or four ways to do it. But um, yeah, this card is just insane value. Whenever you cast any non-creature, whether it's a planeswalker, instant sorcery, you know, uh, you get a flicker, any non-land permanent you control and then bring it right back. So you get instant value. Um, you can protect them, anything basically from single target removal, get all your ATBs again, go infinite with whatever the heck. So this card seems insane. Any sort of deck that uh, is like a combo-based deck or a flicker deck, um, this card's going to be crazy. In. Uh, so yeah, Displacer Kitten, you're definitely going to see this card. Uh, Elminster's Simulacrum. Uh, four blue-blue for an instant. For each opponent, you create a token that's a copy of up to one target creature that player controls. Um, this card seems a lot worse than Blatant Thievery. Um... Blatant Thievery, the important mode of that is that your opponents no longer have the great thing that you took. <laughs> so uh, this does not do that. This lets them just keep their thing and all you get is a token that's a copy of it. Um, so I don't think this card's very good. I think this card could be good in like a um, blue-green or blue-white deck that's a token deck specifically. Any way that you can like duplicate this token that you're making or uh, you know get some sort of other effect out of it then maybe I could see this seeing some play in those decks. But I would not jam this into any random blue deck. Definitely not. Um, this card's just, like, fine in situations. Font of Magic, three and a blue for an enchantment. Instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone. Um, I see people play Jace's Sanctum sometimes, which is uh, this spell... Uh, but you get to scry one when you cast uh, instant or sorcery, I think is what it is. Uh, and it gives you a discount of one on your instants and sorceries. Um, I don't think the scry one effect on Jace's Sanctum is uh, worth it. I don't think Jace's Sanctum is in general is worth it. Four mana for that effect is just uh, not good enough. Um, but this card I could see seeing play. As soon as you start getting two mana discount on your instants and sorceries, you're feeling real good. Um, Arcane duel or whatever it's called uh the enchantment that's very similar to this that makes all uh instants and sorceries cost two less um is like a very is a hard proposition because it works for your opponents too so usually it only sees effects it only sees play like in like a group hot decks generally um but this effect is definitely scary as soon as you get to two mana uh two mana discount on this card so i would discount this card especially if your commander is um is very cheap. Um, I plan on trying this in my errant uh, deck, 
because Aaron's only one mana, has flash, so it's really easy to weave into my spells, um, and it's a spell slinging deck. So I anticipate this card will be quite good in that deck, but in general, I think this card is definitely situational. Next up, <clears throat> we have Gale's Redirection. Three blue blue for an instant. Exile target spell, then roll a d20 and add that spell's mana value to the result of the d20 roll. Uh, 1 through 14, you may cast the exiled card for as long as it remains exiled. You may spend mana or mana of any color to cast that spell. You may cast the exiled... Oh, 15 plus, you may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost for as long as that card remains exiled. Um... How likely is this card to hit the 15 plus? Um, in general, you'll probably want to counter spells that are like 4 CMC or higher. Um, so that means you, on average, still need to roll. You still need to roll above average to hit the 15. Um, but being able to cast the spell you exile for free is pretty nice. Um, Spelljack, which is a very similar card to this with the 1 through 14 mode. It's a card that used to see some play back in the day, uh, but it's definitely faded out of uh, playability. Um, the exiling the spell is also nice on this, so it can get around untargetable stuff. Um, but I don't know how many uh, uncounterable spells you are going to want to cast after you exile them. Like, if you have a nice board and you want to protect it from a supreme verdict or something, you'll be happy to have this, but like, uh, I don't know how likely you'll be want to cast that Supreme Verdict at that point, you know what I mean? Uh, and if you hit, like, a Dovin's Veto or something like that, sure, but you spent five mana to counter that Dovin's Veto, and then you, like, drew a card off of it. Uh, I don't know. This card's fun, but it's not, like, good. Um, is the long and the short of it. Ichthalid Harvester. Four and a blue for a 4-4 four, four horror. This one has adventure. We're going to do the same way we did it last time. I'm going to read the main card first. Uh, when this enters the battlefield, turn any number of target tapped non-token creatures face down. They're 2-2 two, two horror creatures. So it does like an Ixodron impression. Um, and then the other mode, the adventure mode on this, uh, facilitates that uh, the main cast of this card. It's X blue blue. Uh, it's plant tadpoles. Uh, tap up X target creatures. They don't untap during their controller's next untap step. Um, so you can freeze uh, whatever creatures are relevant. Um, but then they're going to know that you want to cast this uh, the next turn. So that way you flip those creatures face down and to tutus and kind of blank them. Um, notably, if you aren't familiar with Ixodron or cards like this, um, unless the card has a way to flip itself over like Morph or something, it's just stuck as a vanilla 2-2 with no abilities. Um, so, yeah, that's nice. Um, you can kind of strand commanders on the battlefield with this effect and such. Um, that being said, I would only play this card probably in uh, decks that are heavy on tapping your opponent's stuff. Or decks that care about the creature type. Or decks that care about the adventure on this card. This card on its face is just not good enough. Um, but... If you care about one or multiple uh, kind of things about this card, uh, then maybe it could make your deck. But in general, the play pattern of this card doesn't feel great. Um, like I said, first you'll play the adventure and freeze their stuff. And then this is sitting in face up in exile. So they're like, crap, whatever I don't want else to die that he didn't target, uh, I have to make sure I don't tap him. So then they just don't. And then either you have to play this your next turn or the thing that you wanted to kill that you froze is going to untap anyway. So it puts you in a really weird position. Um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, you can kind of get people sometimes if they like alpha strike you and you have no board. Uh, and then you play this down and turn all their idiots into two twos. Um, but then you're kind of on the back foot because this is like, you probably don't have much going on otherwise if they're alpha striking you. So yeah, uh, this card's not like great for sure. Next up, uh, modify memory four and a blue for a sorcery. Exchange control of two target creatures controlled by different players. If you control neither creature, draw three cards. Very interesting. So the main thing I see with doing with this card is taking um, two of your opponents, two different opponents' commanders, and making them swap. Because um, then neither of them gets like the uh, value out of their commanders. Um, and they both, you know, it kind of, 
not shuts off each of their decks, but it makes their decks a lot more awkward to play. Uh, and then you also get to draw three cards out of the scenario. Five mana draw three is definitely not like playable. Um, but when it can mess with two of your opponents, maybe. Um, I definitely wouldn't slam this in every blue deck though, for sure. This card's like fine at best. Um, but if you have one crappy thing and your opponent has one incredible thing, you can also just, uh, you know, uh, do a switcheroo. Uh, if you're familiar with that card, it's the same mana cost and does the effect of, uh, swapping two creatures. Uh, so yeah, this card's like a switcheroo with upside basically. Um, but I don't know. The upside doesn't feel like amazing on this card. Uh, this is a fun card. I don't think this card's like great or anything. <laughs> Robe of the Arch Magi. Two and a blue for her equipment. Whenever an uh, equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, draw that many cards. It equips for four. And it can equip to a shaman, warlock, or wizard for one mana. Um, so, this card's a little weird. Uh, equip four and mana cost of three is like infinite mana. Um, having said that, uh, yeah, I don't think this card's good if you're just equipping it to like whatever you have. If you're equipping it to a Warlock, Shaman, or Wizard, though, then this card is definitely interesting. Um, and I do like the mode of, you know, you can at least equip it to anything. But definitely you want to equip this to a Shaman, Warlock, or Wizard. Generally, it seems like um, Warlock would be the best one. Warlocks definitely seem to be, on average, bigger than a Wizard or a Shaman. There are definitely some big Shamans, but Wizards, uh, there's not a ton of big Wizards. Uh, so, yeah. I would definitely say this card is like fine. You have to deal combat damage to the player, not their planeswalker, not damage to anything. Um, and so you want to have like a like a like one of this creature that you're equipping it to be evasive, probably. Because if your opponent sees this sitting on the battlefield, it paints a pretty big target on whatever you want to equip it to. Um, so yeah, definitely this card is tricky, uh, but it does have a, a very good payoff. Um, so yeah, I think this card is like fine. I don't think this card's particularly good, but uh, it's definitely interesting. Definitely can do stuff. Uh, Tomb of Horrors Adventure. Oh, I will say one more thing about this card. Um, you, you'll hear me say this a lot about cards that care about tribal stuff. If the card you're putting in your tribal deck is not part of the tribe, uh, you, on, you don't have a lot of deck slots for that effect. And it has to be very good if that's the effect that you're going to do. Because otherwise you could just put a card of that tribe in your deck. And then it synergizes with the whole rest of your deck. Um, whenever you cast the Inch of the Battlefield, you can tap it to do this effect. Yada, yada, yada. All the things that tribal decks do. So having said that, um, just consider that. When you're even considering it for the tribals that this asks you to put it in. Sorry about that. Uh, Tomb of Horrors Adventurer. Five and a blue for an elf monk. It's a four, four. When it's a battlefield, you take the initiative. When you cast your second spell each turn, copy it. If you completed a dungeon, copy that spell twice instead. You may choose your targets for the copy. Hmm. This card's definitely tricky. Uh, it's a lot of mana. The effect on it only triggers sometimes. Being exactly the second spell. Not after your first spell. It's exactly your second spell. And it asks you to complete a whole dungeon before you can even get the super nice mode uh, that would make this card worth playing, which is copying a spell twice. Um, this card just has a million hoops to jump through, so I don't foresee this card being playable. This doesn't have any sort of evasion to get you the initiative back, um, so it seems unlikely that you would complete a dungeon unless you were a dungeon deck for this card. Um, and if you're a dungeon deck, I don't know, like, I don't know, you're, you're not going to be, I, I don't foresee you, like, storming off and always having a second spell every single turn to cast. Um, so, yeah, I don't think this is a particularly interesting or good card. Um, the one thing of note that is nice is that it copies any spell you cast, not just instant or sorcery. So, if you cast a creature, spell, or an artifact, you get a permanent that's a token copy of it. Um... So I guess that's cool, but this card just has a hundred hoops to jump through to make this card good. So I don't like this card. Another card I don't like, Wizards of Thay. Three and a blue for a human wizard. It's a 3-3. Three, three. Uh, it has myriad. Instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. You may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash. 
Um, so this card asks you to play a really bad rate creature, a 4-mana 3-3. Three, three. Um, it wants you to attack with this 4-mana 3-3. Three, three. Uh, and then it also wants you to cast your instant and sorcery spells during combat. Um, because luckily it lets your sorceries cast during combat. But the tokens only stay during combat. Um, not to like the end step or anything like that. So any spell that you'd want to cast while you have this three mana discount, this and the two tokens that have this ability on them, uh, you have to do it right then. So it definitely limits your window of uh, when you want to do stuff and like how much information you have when you want to cast the spells. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think this card's good. It's asking you to put a creature into your instant sorcery deck uh, that doesn't have enough payoff, asks you to do uh, have hoops to jump through. And then the payoff is like, uh, hopefully this doesn't die in combat and you get some discount temporarily during your turn. I don't know. I would just rather play like just about any of the other discount uh, effects over this one. One of the black cards, uh, Altar of Baal. One in a black uh, for an artifact. Uh, pay two, black, tap, exile a creature you control. Return to a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Activate only as a sorcery. This also is adventure, so for two and a black, you can play Bone Offering. You create a tapped 4-1 black skeleton creature token with Menace. Um, this is one of the ones where I find it hard to imagine I would, like, almost ever cast the adventure. Because the adventure on this is just so bad. A 4-1 tapped Menace token is, like, for three mana, is so useless. The rate is so bad. Um... The only reason you would do it is if you had, like, a blank board and you really needed the fodder of the bone offering. But this card is already mana intensive on its face. It's two mana to play and then three to activate. So, for me personally, I would rather not waste my time with that three mana adventure. I'd rather just start getting this thing developed and pay the two mana up front. And then either try to activate it immediately or, um, you know, at least play something else alongside of this. Instead of wasting three mana to kind of do nothing. Um... Yeah, uh, this card, This having said that, ignoring the adventure, this card's interesting. Um, the fact that you have to exile the creature is kind of tough, so you can't, like, loop two creatures. And this taps itself, so, like, this card has a lot of, like, stops to make this card fair. Uh, only activated as a sorcery as well. This card, uh, yeah. It is a recurrable, it is a uh, continuous recursion engine, uh, you know, so that's nice. Um, but you can't keep looping the same things over and over. Luckily, you can at least exile tokens, which is why the other mode makes the token for you um, to get back a real creature from your graveyard. But all that being said, uh, I don't think this card's very good. Um, it is quite cool, though. Um, and I do expect to see some play. But you just have to like put your hand over that adventure side because it's uh, pretty bad. I would just ignore that. Ancient Brass Dragon. Uh, so this is the black cycle of the Elder Dragons. Uh, this one is 5 black black, 7-6, uh, and when it hits a player, you roll a d20, and you put any number of target creature cards with total mana value of the result uh, from graveyards under the battlefield under your control. Let me take a drink here real quick. Sorry, I kind of did this video with the sore throat too, so I'm fighting through this one, but we're, we're going to get there. <clears throat> um... This one's definitely uh, below average. I would say that this is, like, of the five, this is, like, number four. Um, I do like this card. This effect is definitely the most interesting out of all of them. Uh, it's very cool. It can lead to some very cool moments. Um, but any t obviously, the, the thing that's nice about this card is you can reanimate your opponent's creatures. That being said, if you're relying on to reanimate your opponent's creatures, it's also a pretty big downside because who's to say that they're even going to have things in there for you to get? So this card is going to be best in a deck where you have reliable access to your own cards because your own cards will also synergize with your own deck. Um, sure, you might be able to randomly hit like a Sun Titan or a really cool value card off of one of your opponent's graveyards. Um, but that's only if you hit like a good result because then you can get that and like something back from your graveyard or whatever. But that's never a thing you want to rely on. You always want to try to play your own game. And then incidentally, if you can get some cool value from your opponents, then that's cool. Um but yeah, uh, seven mana, seven six. Uh, this one's like four for me, number four of the five. Um, very cool card though, very fun card. So I do like this card, um, but it's definitely it's big and splashy, but it's definitely not like the most powerful. 
Uh, Asterian's Thirst, uh, three and a black for an instant. Exile target creature, put X11 counters on a commander creature you control, where X is the power of the creature exiled this way. Um, this card's definitely not, like, very good. Um, it can only exile creatures. You can't hit planeswalkers. It doesn't have any sort of flexibility. The exile is nice over just straight-up murder. Um, but you can only put the 1-1 one -one counters on a commander you control. So you have to be, like, exactly Voltron. Um, and then this is, like, a bad Voltron card. Because um, you want to exile something big and actually get a good amount of counters on it. This card's just pulling in way too many different directions. Uh, and it's not, like, widely applicable. So I don't think this card's good. <clears throat> Blood money. Five black black for a sorcery. Destroy all creatures. For each non-token creature destroyed this way, you create a tapped treasure token. Um, this card uh, definitely could have been insane. Um, and nowadays, with how much treasure production we've just been unleashed upon us, um, I kind of anticipated this card to not say tapped on it um, and also not say non-token. Uh, however, they did put non-token and tap treasure. Um, that being all, that being said, I think this card's like fine though. Um, I definitely would rather play like a decree of pain if I'm going to play a big board wipe compared to this. Um, but I'd probably play this over like a necromantic selection or some of those other uh, bigger black board wipes. Because um, even though you're going to take the turn off uh, to cast this, your next turn you're going to have like 30 mana. So uh, yeah, this card definitely is cool. Uh, I would recommend putting this into a deck where you can care about the treasure. Uh, that being like a deck that cares about sacking artifact tokens or something like that. And I would put it in a deck that can reliably get to 7 mana way before you're supposed to have 7 mana. So that way you're not like, you know, even though you're taking the turn off to cast this, that you're not like super behind or anything. So I think this card is like fine though. I don't think it's like good, but it definitely can have some big swingy splashy moments for sure. <clears throat> Next up, Bone Caller Cleric. One in a black for a 2 1 human cleric. You can pay three in a black and sacrifice this creature. Return target creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. Activate only as a sorcery. Don't sleep on this card. We definitely have effects similar to this that are cheaper mana, like Apprentice Necromancer, Doom Necromancer, those cards. But what's way better about this card than those cards, even though it costs a little bit more mana to activate the ability, is you do not have to tap this. So this can, you can do this to the turn this comes into play, if you really want to. Now that's not the best rate, obviously, paying 6 mana to reanimate a creature. Not that great. But this is a creature, just like those other cards, Apprentice Necromancer and Doom Necromancer, this is a creature that can reanimate other creatures. Notably, this doesn't exile itself or anything like that. Um, it would be pretty hard to loop this card and go infinite. Um, but even if you can't, this is definitely... I would definitely rather play this over, like, Null Priest of Oblivion. Or you have to pay the kicker immediately. You can't like put it on layaway and do the effect later or anything like that. So yeah, I would definitely, uh, I definitely see Bone Collar Cleric is going to see some play for sure. Uh, don't sleep on this card. This card's pretty cool and pretty good. Call to the Void. Speaking of cards that are not very good, <laughs> uh, four and a black uh, for a sorcery. Each player secretly chooses a creature they control and a creature they don't control. Then those choices are revealed. Destroy each creature chosen this way. This card is not good, but it is uh, quite fun. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's some sort of optimal play line here. Um, but this is just going to cause chaos and just be crazy. And it's going to be like, whoa, why did you choose that thing? Now I lose all my things and all this stuff. So this is going to lead to some fun play experiences. But uh, this card is not good. But it will definitely lead to uh, a lot of stories. <laughs> Elder Brain. Uh, five black black for a horror. It's a 6-6. Six, six. I'm kind of mad this is not a brain creature type, because we do have eye creature types, so it is a bummer that this didn't get the brain creature type. Uh, but they're trying to support horrors, so I guess they wanted to make this a horror. I get it. But it would have been funny. 6-6 <laughs> six, six, Menace. When the, whenever this attacks a player, exile all cards from that player's hand, then they draw that many cards. You may play lands and cast spells from among the exiled cards for as long as they remain exiled. If you cast a spell this way, you may spend mana as a man of any color to cast it. So when you attack a player, you get to basically draw their hand, which is pretty sweet. Um, very splashy effect. Cool. Has menace, so it can uh, kind of help it get in there without dying. Uh, you don't have to connect with the player for this effect to trigger, but you would rather connect with the player, so that way you don't have to lose this in the process, obviously. Um, that being said, uh, this card has potential. You really want to give this thing haste, just like the Elder Dragons. Um, but it does draw you a lot of cards. 
Um, notably, there are cards from your opponent's deck, so they're not like guaranteed to synergize with your deck. Um, so if your opponent's playing a very linear deck, like a tribal deck or something, then obviously the cards are worse, but it's very fun. <clears throat> Sorry, throat's hurting a bit. Yeah, so that being said, this card is fun. Um, I could see situations where this card's actually good. So for that reason, I'm going to say it's a pretty good card. <clears throat> Eldritch Pact. Black and six for a sorcery. Target player draws X cards and loses X life, where X is the number of cards in their graveyard. I think this card sucks. Um, seven mana to draw some cards is, like, pretty bad. Um, it is cute that you can use this as, like, a burn spell on your opponent if they're, like, heavy milling. But they have to be pretty heavy milling for you to want to spend seven mana on a burn spell on them. Because, like, how much mana are you going to put in this before you'd rather just cast a Torment of Hellfire and, like, just straight up kill them? So... Yeah, that being said, uh, if you want to draw, like, your own deck, then you'd be way better off with, like, Peer into the Abyss. Because um, you only lose half your life, and you draw half your deck, regardless of any other thing going on in the game. Um, so, yeah, I think this card is much worse than both of those other cards I mentioned. Um, yeah, I don't think there's much to say about this card. I don't think it's very good. Intellect Devour. Three and a black for a horror. It's a 2-4. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent exiles a card from their hand until this leaves. Uh, and while this is on the battlefield, you may play lands and cast spells from among the cards exiled, and you spend mana as though mana of any color. So it temporarily draws you three cards, the worst card in each of your opponent's hands, probably. Card's fine. Uh, don't think it's particularly great, um, but it is fun, especially if you can like flicker it after you've cast the spells. But at that point, you're living in magical Christmas land. Um... This card's just like fine. I could see it playing, seeing playing like a horror deck exactly or something, but um, it's not as good as like a Conti or something like that. But it's fine if you can care about the creature type or something. Packed weapon. I think this card just sucks. I don't know what this card does. Uh, three and a black for an equipment. As long as it's attached to a creature, you don't lose the game for having zero or less life. So you can lose the game in other ways, but you can not lose the game if you run out of life, which is weird. Uh, so if you get infected or draw your deck, you still actually lose. This isn't a straight-up Platinum Angel effect. Whenever equipped creature attacks, draw a card and reveal it. The creature gets plus X, plus X until end of turn, and you lose X life, where X is the card's mana value. So it does like a weird Bob effect when you attack. Uh, and then the equipped cost is discard a card. Oof, man. I don't, this card seems bad. Uh, this card just has such weird disparate parts. Uh, I don't know what this card's trying to do. Um, it doesn't seem like a very good Voltron card because you have to throw away cards. Uh, I mean, maybe if you're in like a discard deck where you care about discarding your own cards, like a madness deck or something, then maybe you can kind of use this as like a pseudo madness outlet. But in the madness decks I played, I can't ever see wanting this card because this card itself doesn't have madness and the payoff for having it's not good enough to not be a madness card. So yeah, I, I don't know where this is supposed to go. I don't know what this does. It just seems really bad to me. Because you'd like discard a card. They blow you out by killing your creature that you're trying to equip it to. And then if next time you want to equip it, you have to want to discard another card. Yeah, this card just seems bad. And it and the pump that it gets is like unreliable. Like compared to this to just like a sword of fire and ice or something. Like holy shit. The difference is just insane. There's just, yeah, there's not, I don't think there's hardly any redeeming qualities about this card. It doesn't even stop you from losing the game to, like, anything other than life loss, which is, like, okay, I, I really don't lose that many games where I have zero life. It's usually some other effect, so, yeah, uh, this card sucks. And it has to be equipped to a creature to give you that effect, so. Yeah, everything about this card is just really bad. Don't play this card. Ravenloft Adventurer, three and a black for a three, four, human rogue assassin. When it's the battlefield, you take the initiative. If creature and opponent control would die, instead exile it, and you put a hit counter on it. Ooh, we got a hit counter card. Uh, whenever this attacks, if you've completed a dungeon, defending player loses one life for each card they own in exile with a hit counter on it. Oh, so the payoff for having hit counters is not very good here. <laughs> anyway, that being said, uh, this card's fine, I think, overall. Introdu introducing the initiative is nice. Uh, the the uh, creature hate... Uh, replacement effect like a mini rest in peace is really nice uh, that's the main kind of draw for this card to me uh, and then the last ability is like 
maybe if you've completed a dungeon, it'll do some damage. But that last block of text, I would mostly ignore. Um, unless you're in exactly a dungeon deck, and then you want to use this as, like, graveyard hate in your dungeon deck or something. Then, like, okay, I guess. But, yeah, the middle line of text is what interests me. And then the top line of text is like, okay, maybe I could play this card. And then the bottom line of text is like, I basically just ignore that. Uh, so yeah, this card's like fine. I'll This will definitely see some play in like dungeon decks or um, decks that care about the hit counter or something. So it's fine. All right, we're on to the red cards. Ancient Copper Dragon. Four red red. This is the, uh, so six mana for this dragon. This is the red one. And when this one hits a player, you roll d20 and you create that number, that many treasure tokens. Notably, those treasure tokens are not tapped. So this is like an insane ritual. And you're in the color of haste. So six mana. It's a very playable uh, mana cost. Uh, you're in the color of haste. So it's likely you can give this haste with an anger in your graveyard or fervor on the battlefield or whatever. Um, and then you get all your mana back and then some probably and when this attacks. So yeah, this is definitely going to this is definitely the best dragon out of them. Um, it's not really close. You could realistically just throw this in a random red deck and it would be pretty insane. Um, yeah, this one's obviously the pushed one. Um, and it got there. I think this one's uh, very good. Balhor. Three red red for a demon. Five five. It has flying. And when it attacks or dies, you choose one or more. Each mode must target a different player. Target opponent draws three cards, then discards three cards at random. Target opponent sacrifices a non-token artifact. Balor deals damage to target opponent equal to the number of cards in their hand. Um, this card's quite fun, um, but it's not, like, good. <laughs> um, I do love that this is, like, the Balrog, because uh, I'm a big Lord of the Rings nut. Uh, so, naturally, I'm drawn to this card, um, but... Taking that out of the equation, this card is, like, uh, just fine. Uh, making one opponent draw three and discard three at random is pretty funny. It's very likely to mess up their plan. Um, just don't target the graveyard player with it, because they're just going to be very thankful no matter what they throw in their graveyard. Uh, and then the other two modes are, like, I don't know, pretty whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, all the modes on this are pretty whatever. So even even though you got to do all of them, I, I'm not really enthused about this card. Outside of the uh, the the cool reference, blood boil sorcerer three and a red for a human shaman. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you take the initiative, and you can pay uh, one and a red and sacrifice an artifact or creature. Goad target creature. Um, the initial mana cost of this card, four mana up front, is a lot to ask, but you do get the initiative, so you get some value back from it immediately. Um, but the effect of paying two mana and sacrificing an artifact or a creature to go target creature, and you can do that as many times as you want. You don't have to tap this creature. Uh, you don't, so you can do it immediately when it comes out. I think this is a pretty cool goad card. Um, this card's nothing like broken or stellar or anything, but this card will see play. Uh, and I think this card is a pretty good goad and sacrifice outlet. So don't sleep on this card. Carnelian Orb of Dragonkind. Two and a red for an artifact. Uh, you tap to add a red mana. And if you spent this mana on a dragon spell, uh, it gains haste until end of turn. They made a whole cycle of these, but I think this is really probably the only one that's playable uh, in Commander. I don't think any of the other ones are going to make the cut. Um, but this one is quite nice. Um, red is the main color of dragons, so this produces the best mana for your dragons. And giving haste to a dragon, um, you're likely probably going to play a decent amount of haste enablers in your dragon tribal deck. Um, but having this, having that effect just on another card, on a mana rock, a card that you already want to put in your deck, um, obviously three mana is not the most efficient mana rock, but the upside of this card is pretty huge for your dragon tribal deck. Um, so yeah, I, I would, I, I would definitely consider this in your dragon tribal deck, especially your non five color dragon tribal decks. Caves of Chaos Adventure, three and a red for a five, three with trample human barbarian. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you take the initiative. When it attacks, exile the top card of your library. If you've completed a dungeon, you may play that card this turn without paying its mana cost. Otherwise, you may play that card this turn. Um, this card seems quite bad unless you've completed a dungeon. Um, because you have to. this has to be the thing that attacks. Um, and you only get one card out of it. 
Once again, the initiative is nice upside, but I would only play this in a deck that uh, is a dungeon deck and you can reliably complete a dungeon before this card even ever hits the battlefield. Um, but yeah, I mean, the upside of playing the card without paying its mana cost is not bad, but it's still only one card, so this card's mostly unplayable. Descent into Avernus. This card's probably unplayable, but it is hilarious. Uh, two and a red for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, put two Descent counters on Descent into Avernus. Then each player creates X treasure tokens, and a Descent into Avernus deals X damage to each player, where X is the number of Descent counters on this. Um, so this is a reference to uh, Descent into Madness from Avacyn Restored, uh, which is a five mana black enchantment that does a similar thing. It gets one, uh, if I remember right, it gets one Madness counter per turn. Uh, and then uh, each player sacrifices a thing based on the descent counters on it, if I remember right. Um, that card is hilarious, and this one is also hilarious. Uh, but this one ramps up way quicker. Uh, I can't promise this will make you win, but it will definitely make the game go a lot faster. Because uh, each upkeep, you get two counters on this. And so each turn, uh, each player will make two plus the number of, you know, it'll, you'll get two treasures each extra turn after this comes out. And it will deal X damage to each player. So people are going to start dying, creating tons of mana, killing each other. Uh, this card's not good, but it will definitely speed up your games and be uh, lead to hilarious games. The nice thing, the one nice thing about this card is you get the mana immediately because it makes the treasure tokens untapped and it happens on your upkeep. So you definitely get access to the mana first, which is nice, but this card doesn't make this card good by any means. Uh, El Tour, El Turel, El Turel Survivors. We got there. Three and a red for a Tiefling Peasant. It's a zero four. It has Trample and Myriad. As long as it's attacking, it gets plus X plus zero, where X is the number of lands defending player controls. This is a pretty nice little uh, Punisher card for uh, insane ramp decks. Um, but it's not like insane enough where they can't just like kill this thing because it only has four toughness because only the power scales. Um, that being said, you don't have to put the main one into Trouble's Way. Uh, you can attack four toughness is a decent number. So you can probably find one person that you can get in on uh, and not trade this thing off with. Um, but yeah, this thing can do a ton of damage. Uh, so yeah, this card's cool, but uh, I don't think this card's particularly playable outside of like maybe mono red where you can like double the damage or something to actually make it add up to a ton. Um, but yeah, this card's cool. I do like the I do like the overall design of this card. Fur blo fur bulg flu flute flutist. Fur bulg flutist. Sure. <laughs> four red red for a four four. Giant bard. Uh he looks like just a normal person in the scale, according to the people behind him, but you know, whatever. Apparently he's a giant. Uh when he enters the battlefield, gain control of target creature you don't control until end of turn. Untap it, it gets haste and myriad until end of turn. Wow, the Myriad has a really nice touch here. Um, it allows you to kind of get ETB triggers off the creature if you, you know, steal a Sun Titan. I reference Sun Titan a lot, apparently. Uh, if you steal a Sun Titan, you'll get the attack trigger plus two ETB triggers off of it, which is super nice. Um, this card's cool. Uh, six mana is a lot for this effect, though. Um, Zealous Conscripts is five mana, and it's really mostly playable just because you can pretty easily go infinite with it. Um, but being able to steal like a planeswalker that's about to ult and ult it instead is is a feels good man. Um, but yeah, this card's fun. But like a lot of cards in the set, I don't think it's particularly powerful. The myriad is a is a really nice touch. Don't sleep on it though. Ooh, this is a good one. Ingenious artillerist, two and a red for a three one human artificer. This one's a common. Whenever one or more artifacts enter the battlefield under your control, ingenious artillerist deals that much damage to each opponent. Ooh, we got another Reckless Fireweaver, everybody. Oh, man, we needed more of this effect. Uh, and I'll pay three mana for this effect all day. Even on a bad body, a three one, I don't care. I'll take this effect all day. This effect is very powerful with how much treasure generation and such we have nowadays. You can nuke people with this effect. Uh, when I read this effect initially, I was scared because I read whenever one or, one or more, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to make 20 treasure tokens and deal one damage. Nope, it does say deals that much damage to each opponent. I don't know why they worded it that way. Maybe it's just to make not a million triggers pop up or whatever. Um, so it's just one big trigger. But yeah, either way, it is basically the same thing as Reckless Fireweaver for three mana. Uh, and we'll take more of that effect for sure. So this card's great. I'm very happy we got another one of these. Inspired Tinkering. 
four and a red for a sorcery. Exile the top three cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may play those cards, and you get to create three treasure tokens. That's nice. Um, so it's impulse draw for three cards for two mana um, because you get three of it back for from the five. Um, that being said, you can also save that three mana up for layaway and use it next turn since till the end of your next turn you can play those cards. So if you have one giant spell, you can still get access to it with your treasures that you make. Um, I think this card's just a balanced card. It seems decent. Uh, in your treasures decks and stuff, this would be nice card draw. Um, gives till the end of your next turn, like a lot of the newer impulse draw cards have. So, yeah, definitely this card uh, is pretty solid. I expect to see this uh, to have some play. Reckless Barbarian, 2 and a red for a Dragon Barbarian, 2-2, two, two, another common. Uh, this card just has one line of text. Sacrifice Reckless Barbarian, add 2 red mana. Um, this is another one in the line of don't sleep on this card. This one, um, cards like this uh, that basically give you their mana back uh, immediately by sacrificing them are uh, quite scary effects. They give you free storm count. Um, they allow you to put your mana on layaway and have a big turn later. Uh, this is a dragon. I don't think that's super relevant here, but it's something. Um, yeah, this effect is, um, is always good. Um, uh, it's narrowly good. It only goes in certain archetypes that are generally looking to do degenerate things. That being said, um, keep your eye out for this card. This card will see some play somewhere. And if you see this card on the battlefield, you're either playing against a dragon tribal deck that's probably not very good because it's this card's in the deck, <laughs> or you're playing against a pretty degenerate deck, so... Uh, yeah, this card should uh, definitely do something. Uh, keep your eye out on this one. Next up, Storm King's Thunder. X and triple red for an instant. When you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell X time. You may choose new targets for the copies. This card is just very mana intensive. You gotta spend four mana before you get one copy out of your next spell. Five mana for two copies. I mean... Man, how much mana are you going to actually ca have to cast the thing that you want to cast afterwards, right? I will note one nice thing about this card, and effects like this card that they've been printing recently, is um, it makes the copies uh, as soon as you cast the card. So you don't have the potential to get blown out by, you know, you cast the spell, and then you hold priority, so that way you can make sure you can dual cast it or whatever and make a copy of it. But if they counter the original spell before the dual cast becomes a copy of it, which they have an opportunity to in, re uh, in response, then you lose both cards and get nothing. So this card definitely removes some of that feel bad. Um, but man, this card is very mana intensive. And I don't think this card's going to see much play. Um, yeah, uh, it's a bummer. But this, this card's cool, but I don't anticipate seeing this. I don't think this card's very good. Very, very cool art too. Wand of Wonder. Oh, man, it's got a lot of text on it. Uh, three and a red for an artifact. Four, tap, roll a d20. Each opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile an instant or sorcery card, then shuffles the rest of the, into their library. You may cast up to X target instant or sorcery spells from among those cards exiled this way without paying their mana cost. And uh, based on the ones you get to cast is based on what you roll. So one and a nine, uh, you get to cast one of them. Ten through a 19, you get to cast two of them. 20 through uh, a 20 gets you allows you to cast all three of them um this card is uh very man intensive but as soon as you start hitting like two three spells off this card which on average you will hit uh two um then yeah this card uh will start to do something obviously this is just a fun card uh because you're only getting your opponents instant of sorcery so they're unlikely to you know interact with your deck very well um but yeah, if you like Chaos Wand, then you're going to like this card. This card's really sweet uh, for fun. But uh, obviously not a, a good card, but a very, very fun card. Wild Magic Surge. Red, red for an instant. Destroy target permanent and opponent controls. This controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a permanent that shares a card type with that permanent. They put that card on the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of their library in a random order. Um... This card is definitely worse than Chaos Warp, but if you're in red, mono red specifically, or in like red black, and you have a hard time dealing with certain, excuse me, certain permanent types like enchantments, 
this is another tool for you that you can use to blow up those uh, pesky enchantments or problem permanents. Notably, this does not uh, shuffle it in, so you cannot get around indestructible effects um, like you can with Chaos Warp. And they're guaranteed to get something, unlike Chaos Warp. Uh, and in fact, they have to get something of the same type. Um, all that being said, uh, two mana instant is, uh, is, a, is a nice rate for this card. This card will definitely see play. Um, when you really need interaction for certain things, uh, this is there. This is a really good oh shit button. Um, but it's definitely not uh, catch all quite as well as Chaos Warp is. Wrathful Red Dragon. Three red red for a 5-5 five, five dragon with flying. Whenever a dragon you control is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to any target that isn't a dragon. Um, yay, we finally got one good tribal dragon card in the set that's not the big mythic dragons. Uh, yeah, this one's a nice one. This one punishes your opponents pretty hard for trying to kill your dragons with damage or blocking or anything like that. Uh, it makes combat a nightmare. It makes a lot of damage-based removal really bad against you. Um, good rate, 5 mana for a 5-5 five, five is totally acceptable. Um, yep, this is just a good dragon for your dragon deck. Will's Reversal, 2 and a red for an instant. Choose target spell or ability that with 1 or more targets. Roll d d20 and add the greatest power among creatures you control. Uh, 1 through 14, you may choose new targets for that spell or ability. 15 plus, you may choose new targets for that spell or ability, then copy it, and then choose new targets for the copy. Um, this card is definitely better than, like, Chef's Kiss, um, which is a card that's uh, cool, but not particularly good because you can't direct it in any way, um, but it will stop your thing from dying or whatever. But notably, one thing I like about this card is it has uh, deflecting SWAT text, uh, it says choose target spell or ability with one or more targets. Um, deflecting swap, part of the reason uh, it's really good is people, I think people kind of slept on the ability part of the text because deflecting swap says you can change the target of target spell or ability. Um, and a lot of times cards like these usually say just spell or spell with a single target. You know, they're very limiting. But the reason deflecting swap's so good um, is because it's a catch-all. Anything that targets, basically, you can redirect it. Uh, and similar, similarly, this has that text as well, which is really nice. Uh, and then sometimes the add greatest power among creatures you control is not likely to add very much uh, to your count. So I, you, you are probably more than likely still going to hit a 1 through 14, uh, which for 3 mana is like fine. Uh, it's decent. Uh, if you hit the 15 plus though, being able to copy that uh, spell or ability seems quite nice. Um, and you can direct it how you'd like. So, I think this card's playable, but I don't think it's great. Um, it'll definitely see some play, though, and it's definitely a fine card. Uh, and if you ever hit the 15+, plus, you're going to feel pretty great. Um, so, yeah, this card's good. It's fine. All right, now we're on to green. We get to the uh, final dragon. Uh, Ancient Bronze Dragon. It's 5 green green for a 7-7. Seven, seven. And when this uh, hits a player, you roll a d20 and you get x11 counters on up to two target creatures where x is the result. Um, so obviously the mana cost on this card is going to be the easiest to hit because you're in green. Um, so you have all the mana ramp you could ever want. Um, but this one definitely has the worst of all of them's effect. Um, you don't want to. You can put the 11 counters on this dragon. But you generally want to put them on your two other creatures because they already want to kill this thing. Uh, so you at least want to make two of your other creatures big threats. Um, but just making two creatures after combat's over big is not like that valuable. Um, your opponents can board wipe and kill your whole board. Uh, or do whatever. You know, all the myriad ways to interact with creatures. Um, there's no way to cheat this. You can't make the creatures like get the counters before you deal damage unless you give this thing double strike. Which if you do, I mean like you're already like omega winning so like i guess <laughs> uh but i definitely think this is the even though it's in green it's the easiest it's gonna be the easiest one to cast i do think this is the worst dragon for sure um yeah this one's effect is pretty mediocre overall uh bar room brawl this card sucks uh one in a green for a sorcery target re creature you control fights target creature the opponent to your left controls then that player may choose to copy this spell and may choose new targets for the copy. <clears throat> so as long as the person, as long as the people in 
line keep having creatures, they can keep making them fight and fight and fight. Um, so you don't get very good control of what you get to fight with this card. And the person to the right can absolutely wreck you. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> this card is uh, not good because it's a very bad fight spell. It's not a good board wipe. Uh, yeah. The play pattern of this card is not going to be beneficial to you or good. So... Uh, if you want to pl try this card out for fun factor, uh, you it may sound fun when you read it, but I promise you will have a bad time with the result of this card. Um, yeah, I do not recommend playing this card. Earthquake Dragon. 14 and a green for a 10-10. The spell costs X less to cast, where X is the total mana value of dragons you control. I really wish that said power, so your dragon tokens could discount this too. But okay, mana value of dragons. Flying Trample, you can pay two green, sacrifice a, two and a green, sacrifice a land, return this from your graveyard to your hand. Okay, being able to buy this back from your graveyard is quite a nice effect on this. Uh, it makes it a pretty formidable threat that you can keep bringing back. Um, it's giant, it has trample and flying. Um, it seems, if, you, if you're discounting this card that much, you're already winning, so like how much more do you need this? Um... But yeah, I think this card's definitely playable in like a red-greens plus more colors dragon deck. Um, it's only has one green mana pip, so it seems pretty splashable in five color dragons too. Um, it seems like a dragon's card. It seems playable. Unplayable card. <laughs> Jahira's Respite. Four on a green for an instant. Search library for up to X basic lands where X is the number of creatures attacking you. Put those creatures on the put those cards on the battlefield tapped and shuffle. Uh, prevent all combat damage that will be dealt this turn. Five mana for a fog that ramps you for just basics and just for the creatures attacking you. This card just seems stone unplayable. The mana on this is just... The, the rate on this card just seems so awful. And, like, if I'm fogging you, like, how much more do I need lands, right? I have five mana to hold up for a fog. I obviously have excess mana. Um, yeah, this card is just stone unplayable. This card sucks. <clears throat> Majestic Genesis. This card's pretty interesting. Six green green. Art's also stellar, by the way. Uh, sorcery. Reveal the top X cards of your library, where X is the greatest mana value of a commander you own on the battlefield or in the command zone. You may put any number of permanent cards from among them onto the battlefield. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. All right. I really like the design of this card and a few car some cards that have existed before this, like Stinging Study. Cards that reward you for paying, playing high CMC commanders. Because there are definitely not enough ways to reward you in commander currently. Right now, it seems like however more efficient you can make your commander, the better. For sure. Because um, it's just a card that you always, always have access to. It's likely to die because it's an important piece in your deck. So if it's cheaper, it's going to be cheaper when you cast it multiple times. So yeah, I really like rewarding uh, people for playing big mana commanders. Um, but is this enough of a reward? Ugh. Unlike Stinging Study, you don't have to go that far for it. It's a five mana draw cards and lose life equal to your grace thing like this does. Um, and for that, when you're only paying five mana, it seems like once you get like five, uh, five CMC commander or above, you're feeling pretty good. Um, this one, I would really want like a, I don't know, like an eight mana commander or something. Ugh. And if I have an eight mana commander, like, wow, do I really want to be casting this instead of my commander? Um, yeah, I could, for me, this card is, is hard to justify. Um, there's one place I could see it played though, as if you're in like a partner deck with like Kamal, um, because he's a really good game ender. Uh, he's eight mana and he has partner. Um, and so that way you could partner him with something cheaper. So you at least have something to do on like the earlier turns. Yeah. So I, I, and, and you can't really put this in like a, uh, a primal surge deck or whatever because the primal surge generally you want to flip over your whole deck uh with all the permanents you want your whole deck to be permanent so you just flip the whole thing over and win or whatever because if you put this in that deck you're all permanence deck then this is just going to stop you from putting your whole board into play and winning when you cast it so yeah for that reason uh you can't put that in the same deck i guess you could but like it doesn't seem very good um but yeah i would i could see this thing playing like a kamal partner deck with something of lower cmc um, but outside of that, this card seems hard to justify, but it's a very cool effect, uh, and I like the design of this card. Next up, we got Monster Manual. 
Three and a green for an artifact. Uh, this one has adventure. Uh, one and a green, you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. So it's got like a Elvish Piper effect. Uh, and then it has Zoology Study, which is the Sorcery Adventure. It's two and a green. Mill five cards, and then return a creature card milled this way to your hand. Um, <clears throat> how do I feel about this card? This card seems okay in like an Adventures Matter deck. Um, I I do like the Elvish Piper effect on this card over Elvish Piper. Um, because Elvish Piper is a bit tricky, because it's a four mana, one one. Uh, so it's, it dies to like anything. So if your opponents are worried about at all, what you're about to put into play, they can kill it with like literally any removal spell that they have. Unlike this card, which is an artifact, which dodges a lot, which dodges all creature removal, obviously. Um, and there's some colors that have a hard time dealing with artifacts. So this card's definitely a lot more reliable, uh, as far as like, you know, being a permanent that you want to keep on the battlefield. Paying two mana instead of one mana for this effect of putting a creature from your hand on the battlefield. That's not a big change to me um, because you're going to be putting in some big chunga where you don't care if you're paying one or two mana because you're not at least you're not paying like eight mana or whatever it is. Right. Um, so, yeah, on its face, this card seems pretty fine. Um, it's not like obscene or anything, but it seems good. Uh, and then the uh, extra upside of having an option of an adventure. Um, if you draw this card late in the game and you don't have much to do with it is nice. Um it is kind of a bummer that you can't put any creature from your graveyard into your hand. You can only put uh, one of the five cards you milled into your hand if it's a creature. So you definitely can whiff. Um, but this card obviously asks you to play a deck with a lot of creatures. So in that deck, I could definitely see uh, this card seeing some play in like a green heavy creature deck um, with big chungas and stuff. So yeah, this card's playable. Uh, next up, Owl Bear Cub. Two and a green for a bird bear. It's a 3-3. Three, three. When it attacks a player who controls eight or more lands, look at the top eight cards of your library. You may put a creature from among them onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. You put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Wow. Uh, obviously, this thing doesn't oh, it doesn't trigger like super often. It's only going to trigger like later in the game or if somebody went super crazy with land ramp early in the game. But I do like the design of this card. Um, once again, punishing people for ramping obscenely is an effect that we need. Uh, I don't think this is a good enough effect to stop people from ramping obscenely, but uh, it pays you off very well, at least, for uh, somebody doing that. Uh, and it punishes them pretty hard by putting some giant idiot on the battlefield tapped and attacking. Once again, this is going to go in a similar deck to uh, the last card. Uh, you're going to want to play this in a, a deck, a big green deck that plays a lot of big green chungas. Um, so that way, when you look at eight cards, you're likely to hit and really hurt them. Um Another nice thing about this is you don't lose that creature. Uh, at the end of turn, a lot of these effects that like you let you put a creature in, like tapping and attacking, like Myriad or something, generally those creatures go away at the end of combat or bounce to your hand or something like that, or you have to sack them. This one, you just got to keep the creature. So that's pretty cool. Um, but other than that, this is just a, you know, it's just a vanilla creature. It's just a three mana, three, three that doesn't do anything until your opponents hit eight lands. So. That being said, uh, this card has some sweet upside, but definitely, um, I, I don't, I don't really foresee the seeing a lot of play for sure, because um, this card just is very situational, and it's very, very bad if you don't meet that situation, and it requires your opponents to get to that situation. So, yeah, the only decks that I could see this in is like a deck that plays a lot of big uh, idiots, uh, or like maybe a group hug deck if you can make your opponents get a lot more lands on the battlefield, but then like. If you're playing group hug deck, like how many big idiots do you have to put into play with all your group hug cards, right? So I don't know where this is supposed to go. Uh, I like the design of this card, but uh, I don't know where it's supposed to go. I don't think this card's particularly uh, that impressive. Under Mountain Adventure, three and a green for a three, four giant warrior. Uh, it has vigilance. Uh, when it is the battlefield, you take the initiative. You can tap to add two green if you completed a dungeon. Uh, oh, sorry. You can tap to add two green. If you completed a dungeon, add six green instead. Whew. I wish they would put the six green pips on here just so you could see how much mana that is. <laughs> uh, that being said, this card is uh, impressive uh, for sure. Uh, just a four mana creature uh, that taps for two mana is like fine. Um, having vigilance so it can get in there is nice. Uh, giving you the initiative so that way you have some get a little bit of value from it is nice. 
Um, but yeah, obviously you really want to complete a dungeon with this thing because six mana is a ton of mana for this card to make. So seems like it goes in a dungeon deck that plays green. Don't know how many of those that exist currently, but uh, maybe this could persuade some people to try that out. So yeah, for that reason, I think this card's good and we'll see play for sure. Because uh, even on its face, this card seems playable. Four mana for three, four vigilance that gives you the initiative and taps for two mana. That seems playable on its face. And then the upside of completing a dungeon is pretty insane. So yeah, I think this card's good. Campfire. Uh, this is one I'm excited for, but not a lot of people probably uh, will play this card. Uh, it's a one mana artifact. You can pay one and tap to gain two life. Or you can pay two and tap this and exile the campfire. Put all commanders you own from your command zone and from your graveyard into your hand. Then shuffle your graveyard into your library. We got another phage enabler, baby. We can put phage in our hands with this card and not kill ourselves. Uh, very excited for this card. Uh, for obviously a very narrow deck of mine. Phage the Untouchable. My favorite deck. Uh, I'll probably do a deck tech of it someday, but I'm going to hold that one off for now. For a special day. Um, but yeah, this card is cool for that reason. I don't foresee this seeing a lot of play though. Uh, but I'm excited for this card. Decanter of Endless Water, 3 mana for an artifact, uh, gives you no max hand size and it taps to add 1 mana of any color. So this is a mana lith that gives you no max hand size. As I've talked about earlier, I don't think no max hand size is a very valuable effect, uh, and I don't think it's worth paying a mana lith for this effect. Part of the reason I think Thought Vessel is playable is just because it's a 2 mana untapped mana rock, so the, the floor of the card is so, so high compared to this card where you're paying an extra mana for this card. Yeah, I, I don't I don't really think this card's playable. Um, the only time I ever foresee like no max hand size being valuable is if you're in a deck that specifically wants you to have a ton of cards in your hand. Like maybe your commando's like Morrow or something where it's like the more cards in your hand, the bigger it gets or something. Um, in like exactly those decks, I could see this seeing play. But a lot of people forget that like sometimes it's good to like draw more than seven cards so that way you can discard the cards that you want to discard for like other effects so um i i think this effect as i've said many times i think this effect is extremely overrated um but there are some decks that you know can take advantage of it not very many so i don't think this card is very playable i don't think it's good uh plus there's like a million better mana lists than this card so yeah i don't like this card fraying line oh my god i have to read this card <laughs> four mana for an artifact Okay, here we go. When it enters the battlefield, put a rope counter on target creature you control. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that may player may pay two mana, two generic mana. If that if they do, they put a rope counter on a creature they control. Otherwise, exile fraying line and each creature without a rope counter on it. Then remove all rope counters from all creatures. Okay, so this is like a weird board wipe that people can like stop and delay and choose what they want to keep. Um, this card's bad. <laughs> um, the only card, the only thing that I would see, like maybe this being a redeeming quality about this card, is if this card didn't exile itself and you could like recur it. Most artifact board wipes usually exile themselves outside of like good ones like uh, Oblivion Stone and the Vineyard's Disc. Um, I don't know. I have no idea where this is supposed to go, uh, but I think this card's bad. Moving on. Lantern of Revealing. Three mana for an artifact. Taps to add one mana of any color, so it's a mana lith. Four mana tap. Look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put that onto the battlefield tapped. If you don't put that card on the battlefield, you may put it in onto the bottom of your library. This card is way better than that last mana lith. That being said, I don't think this is a particularly great mana lith, but at least it gives you something to do. It can sometimes like ramp you uh, and it gives you like a tiny bit of card selection. You, it'll basically just stop you from drawing something you don't want to draw. So um, in that regard, this isn't like a manolith that does stone cold nothing like the last one. Um, but I don't, there's still like a million better manoliths than this card. Uh, but this one is at least interesting. Uh, Mighty Servant of Lekuo. I don't know. <laughs> uh, three mana for a vehicle. It's a six-six with trample. It has ward discard a card, so your opponents have to two for one themselves if they want to kill this. Uh, when this becomes crewed for the first time each turn, if it was crewed by exactly two creatures, it gains whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player. Draw two cards until end of turn, and it has crew four. 
Ooh, this is a pretty decent vehicle. Um, yeah. Uh, if it has crew four, you're like you're likely to have to crew it with two creatures. Not always, but you're likely to have to crew it with two creatures because a, a pilot by itself doesn't crew this. Um, notably, this vehicle does have to do combat damage to a player, but it's a six six with trample, so it's huge. And the ward discard a card is uh, definitely a very valuable ward. Um, unlike paying life or something like that. Making your opponents two for one themselves is definitely going to dissuade them from uh, killing this. And three mana is a very cheap cost for this card. So this is definitely a very playable vehicle um, for sure. Uh, that being said, I would probably not put this in like non-vehicle decks. But in vehicle decks, this is definitely a good vehicle. Uh, Mirror of Life Trapping. It's four mana for an artifact. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield, if it was cast, exile, then return all other permanent cards exiled with Mirror of Life tapping to the battlefield under their owner's control. Uh, what does this do? <laughs> um, this card is, like, uh, very weird. This card is just, like, extremely awkward. <laughs> uh, there's probably a way that you can lock out your opponents with this card, and that's probably all this card will ever do. And commanders just be really obnoxious. Because uh, it reads obnoxious, and it reads like a card that can lock your opponents out. So, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this card seems... Uh, Eternal permanent cards exiled. Does this, does this just stop people with containment priests? Is that what this does? I'm reading this, and I'm thinking about it. I think it just... If you have containment priests, all your opponent's creatures just get exiled permanently when they come back in, right? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, anyway, yep, this card just seems obnoxious. It seems annoying to play against. Uh, you you can probably get locked out with it in some way, uh, at least as far as creatures. But, yep. Uh, you will not want to see this card across from you. <laughs> Nautiloid Ship. Ooh, we got another good vehicle. Four mana uh, for a vehicle. It's a 5-5 five, five with flying. When it enters the battlefield, exile target player's graveyard. Ooh, we love incidental graveyard hate. Uh, whenever Nautiloid Ship deals combat damage to a player, you may put a creature card exiled with Nautiloid Ship onto the battlefield under your control and has crew three. Whew. This card is saucy. I love incidental graveyard hate. You get to exile their whole graveyard. And when it hits a player, which it probably will because it's a 5-5 five, five flyer, um, you can put anything from exile, all the, any of the creatures exiled with it onto the battlefield. Um, this card just seems sick. Uh, I cannot wait to play with this in my vehicles deck. Uh, definitely one of the best vehicles that we've seen so far. Not just in the set, like overall. So yeah, many vehicles players rejoice. This card's great. And it gets crewed with just one pilot if you're a vehicle deck that cares about pilots, which most of them are nowadays. Navigation Orb, three mana for an artifact. Pay two, tap, and sack the orb. Search your library for up to two basic land cards and or gates. Reveal those cards, put them on the, the one onto the battlefield tapped and the other into your hand. Um, hmm. I think this card's cool for a gates deck. Being able to, to uh, get two gates is really nice. Um, but the two basic land section of this card feels pretty bad. Um, you're paying one more mana than an armillary sphere. Armillary sphere is like stone unplayable. You're paying one less mana than a burnished heart on the on the uh, activation cost. But the burnished heart uh, is a creature, so you can bring it back if you really want to. You can eat some damage while you sack it. Um. Burnished Heart being a creature just seems significantly more upside than this card, um, even though this is one less mana because, yeah, the because it puts them both into play tap. So Burnish Heart ramps you way better, and yeah, this is definitely no like colorless cultivate by any means. Um, but yeah, this card is uh, definitely pretty decent in gates decks. I would say the more ways you can tutor up your gates that you want, the better. And this even puts one of them into play for you. So I can see this. Uh, we're gonna talk about some gates here in just a minute. Um, but I could see this one seeing play in exactly gate stacks. Nimble right schematic. Two mana for an artifact. When it is the battlefield or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you create a 1-1 one, one colorless construct artifact creature token. Um, this is the exact same card as servo schematic, um, but this one makes constructs instead of servos. Servo schematic doesn't seem see a lot of play, um, but this card and servo schematic can definitely be good in the right deck um, because they just create a lot of material. When they enter the battlefield, you get two artifacts for the cost of two mana. If you can sack them to like a, a Kark Clan Ironworks or some sort of other effect, 
um, then you can generate mana, and this will even make a third artifact on the way out. Um, so this and Servo Schematic just create a lot of material. Um, so don't like sleep on this card, but we do already have this card existing. The creature, the creature type here doesn't matter at all, I don't think. Uh, so if you want another one of these in your uh, deck that plays Servo Schematic, you got another one. Uh, I don't know how to say this word. Petriar's Seal, we'll go with that. Uh, three mana for an artifact. Uh, mm -hmm. Tap to add one mana of any color. So once again, it's a Manolith. Pay one tap, untap target legendary creature you control. Okay, this is a Manolith that I can start looking at and being interested in. If there's a deck that cares about like an activated ability on my commander that's a tap ability, um, then I'm starting to get interested in this card. Uh, this card definitely can have some upside in the right decks. This one's narrow, but it's a good Manolith in the right decks. So um, this one I could see seeing play for sure. It could be like a maybe, uh, I don't know, I probably I pr still probably wouldn't play this in a green deck unless I really want like a specific card to get untapped. But yeah, anyway, I think this card's uh, the most playable Manolith we've seen in this episode. Prized Statue, two mana for an artifact. When it enters the battlefield or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you create a treasure token. Ooh. Unlike Servo Schematic, this is not one that we've had before. None of this effect... Uh, has ever generated mana. Before we had Icker Wellspring, which drew you a card with this effect. We had uh, Mycosynth Wellspring, which put uh, lets you search for a basic land, put it in your hand when it entered and left. Uh, this one gives you treasure. So this one makes, <clears throat> similar to Servo Schematic, this will make three artifacts total. One when it enters, one itself, and then when it dies, you get another one. Very importantly, this gives you the mana back to cast this card that it costs. So picture this you have um a way to sack this um you you get a treasure token when it comes in uh you sack this uh you pay two mana to cast you sack this you get another treasure token and say you have some way to bring this back uh you know from your graveyard for no mana cost then you have the two mana to replay this and then get another treasure token and do the cycle again so <clears throat> all that being said this card definitely has potential um, it pays for itself. It generates a lot of artifact material for very low mana, which we've said is valuable. Um, yeah, do not sleep on this card. This card will definitely see play somewhere. Uh, it will also definitely cause some infinites. <laughs> uh, this card has all the right words on it to cause some infinites. So, um, yep. Yeah. You start working on the pieces and thinking of ways that you can go crazy with this, but this card's got the right words on it for sure. Rug of Smothering, 3 mana for an artifact creature construct. It's a 1-3. Flying, whenever a player casts a spell, that they lose a life for each spell they've cast this turn. So it's an anti-sort of storm card. Um, <clears throat> I don't know where... I don't think this will see much, if any, commander play. Um, but it's an interesting tool, at least. Um, yeah. I don't know. This card is just a, a weird hate card. The flying on this card is uh, not irrelevant, though. It might like help you get the Monarch or get an initiative or something like that. So um, This card's not embarrassing, but I don't think it really has a home, per se. Stone Speaker Crystal, 4 mana for an artifact. You can tap to add 2 colorless mana, or you can pay 2 tap and sack this. Exile any number of players' graveyards, and you draw a card. You know we love incidental graveyard hate around here. Um, that being said, for four mana, mm, I think I prefer Hedron Archive. Um, the extra card um, is definitely much preferred once I'm in this deep with this card. The exiling players' graveyards is any number of players' graveyards, so you don't have to hit your own, is a really nice upside of this card. And you still get one card back from it, but I don't know. I feel like I would just, if I'm, I don't need to reach this far for Graveyard Hate nowadays, I don't think. I'm already in on, like, Soul Guide Lantern and basically any deck. Um, if you don't care about your own Graveyard, you can play effects like Lantern of the Lost, Relic of Progenitus, cards like that. Really efficient ways to hit on the Graveyard. Hell, if you really want to hit on one player's Graveyard, you can play a Tormod Script. It doesn't cost any mana. <laughs> um, so, yeah. This card's definitely good and will definitely see play. But the four mana mana rock spot is tricky. Um, I do not have many decks that will even play that 
and the decks that I do, I do not have many slots dedicated for that effect. So, that being said, uh, I don't foresee myself playing this card uh, anytime soon, but uh, this card is definitely going to see play, uh, and it will definitely perform well, for sure. This def card's definitely playable. Vexing Puzzle Box, 3 mana for an artifact. Whenever you roll one or more dice, put a number of charge counters on Vexing Puzzle Box equal to the result. Okay. Tap, add one mana of any color, roll a d20. Wow, so that'll add, that's likely to add a pretty good amount of no counters on this card. Uh, you can tap and remove 100 charge counters from this. Search your library for an artifact card, put that card on the battlefield, then shuffle. Wow, 100 charge counters is a lot of charge counters. I think this card, this is this is a fine manolith. Because um, at least, even though you don't get much outside of it being a manolith for quite a while... Um, if you were, if you play in a deck that can untap, uh, artifacts heavily, like with an unwinding clock or something, then, then you might be able to realistically hit a hundred. Um, or if you're in a deck that's a dice rolling deck. Um, <clears throat> however, most cards that allow you to roll multiple dice when you roll a dice usually make you pick a result. So it's not like you can hit 40 off of one dice roll. Um, it'll just increase your value of your dice roll. Um, all that being said... This card's uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah. The, the only thing that's weird about this card is, in my head, what makes me think you um, only get one of the dice that you choose is because usually they say, like, select a dice and ignore the other one for most of the cards that you roll, roll multiple dice. But this does say one or more dice, and it doesn't, it doesn't read like you care about the result. Um, I probably should have looked up this rules interaction ahead of time. But, um, here, give me just one second. This video is already taken forever. Let me look it up. Uh, ah, never mind. I'm not going to look it up. Anyway, I'm not going to interrupt y'all. Well, I'm not going to keep you any longer than I have to. <laughs> um, but yeah, this card's interesting. Uh, this is a better Manolith than all the other ones that we've seen so far. Because the upside is just really, really big. Uh, it gives you something to do in the late game. If you have things that care about artifacts and tapping frequently, then... You can realistically hit uh, 100, so card's cool and interesting. All right, we're going to talk about a few gates here. Um, we got some uh, colorless gates that help you pay off gates, and then we got uh, a cycle of gates. Uh, Basilisk Gate is uh, taps for a colorless. It enters untapped, notably, which is cool. Um, pay two and tap. Target creature gets plus X, plus X to end turn. X is the number of gates you control. Activate only as a sorcery. Deactivate is only as a sorcery. It's a huge downside to this card. Um, if this was, like, a miniature Kessick Wolf run that it doesn't even give Trample, then, like, okay, at least that's a cool effect, but, man. Activate only as a sorcery speed, lets your opponents know what's up. Uh, it allows them to line up their chump blocks, uh, nicely. This effect is just not very good. Then it, but if you are in a Gates deck and you do care about having, uh, Gate cards, um, then this is a card that's a Gate. <laughs> it doesn't fix your mana, but at least it enters untapped, so... Uh, this is probably one of the worst gates. Uh, gate payoffs, I should say. All right, we have a cycle of... Uh, these are our new gates that we got. They're essentially um, vivid... Or not vivid lands. Um, uh, like Thriving Grove and that sort of stuff. Uh, they are enter the battlefield tapped. They're gates. Uh, they, you, when they enter the battlefield, you choose a color. And they add one color and then the car the color you chose. So this one's the black one. It taps for black and then or you could tap it for uh, a mana of the color that you chose. So this is like quite a bit better than like a Rakdos Guild Gate, which has to tap for black or red. Because this one, if you need blue mana, then you can make it a Demir Guild Gate, basically. So these new guild gates are a lot better than the old guild gates, but um, yeah, they're not they're definitely not as good as like the Thrive. Uh, or they're 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 just thriving lands with the gate subtype, basically. So yeah, there's one for each color. This is the black one. Gone Gate. Um, it's a gate, obviously. Gates you control enter the battlefield untapped. That's very, very nice. Uh, tap to add a colorless mana. Or you can tap to add one mana of any color a gate you control could produce. Okay, now this is a real land I could get behind for the gates deck. Um, gates suck because they enter tapped, obviously. Uh, but if all your gates enter untapped now, that's pretty big game. Uh, and this can tap to add one mana of any color uh, that your, your gates control can produce so it fixes you very well too uh and it even taps for a wingding if this is if you don't have any other gates yet so um this is definitely good gates uh payoff for sure 
Heap Gate. Uh, it's a gate. Taps for uh, a colorless mana. You can pay one tap, add one mana of any color. So it's a Shimmering Grotto sort of effect. Uh, you can also pay one tap and tap an untapped gate you control to create a treasure token. Uh, that uh, last ability reads pretty nice, but um, it's not like really that useful because you have to put three mana in. You have to tap this, tap a mana, and tap another untapped gate. So you go in three mana to make a treasure. That being said, it is a nice mana sink. Helps you fix if your uh, mana sucks at the time. Um, and also it has a Shimmering Grotto text, so you can at least fix for less mana than, than the treasure if you need to. But uh, yeah, this one reads better than it is. It's uh, not really that good, but it is an untapped gate. So, And finally, Baldur's Gate, the name of the set. Uh, it's a legendary gate. It taps to add a colorless mana. You can pay two and tap, add X mana of any one color, where X is the number of other gates you control. Uh, once again, that kind of reads better than it is, I think. Having a like a Cabal Coffers effect for your gates, uh, you only get one color of mana. Um, it's like not a bad gates payoff, but I don't think this is as good as the Gates Enter Untapped gate, for sure. Um, and this doesn't produce any colored mana on its own. It only produces colorless mana, so... Uh, I definitely think um, Gone Gate is better than Baldur's Gate, but Baldur's Gate's, like, cool, I guess. Um, when you get to the late game, it can make a decent chunk of mana uh, and ramp you a little bit, but the uh, colorless mana that this produces is uh, kind of a big downside compared to uh, Gone Gate, which can add one mana of any color a gate you control produces and makes it so your mana's not really awkward, so... Baldur's Gate's cool. Um, so I wanted to quickly wrap up the gates here by saying... Um, if you're on like a five color budget deck, uh, as long as all of these gates payoffs stay bulk, like if Baldur's Gate's like $10, then I don't think this is worth it because then it's no longer like a, you know, a, a good strategy. But realistically, if you're in like a five color bulk, uh, bulky like budget deck, then like I could see you making your mana base all gates and then using these uh, gate payoffs plus the other gate payoffs that we already have, um, then it could be worth running uh, without being like exactly trying to win off of... Um, Maze's End, and just using Maze's End as like a backup way to win or something. Um, so yeah, that being said, um, yeah, I don't anticipate Gates taking over anything, though. I definitely wouldn't. If you're on a, you know, a budgetless build, then unless you are exactly trying to win with Maze's End, then I wouldn't bother with Gates. All right, <clears throat> we're on to the uh, Commander uh, set cards, the ones from the actual Commander decks exclusively. Um, so we're getting near the end, so thanks for hanging with me. I'll try to, uh, plow through this real quick. Um, but in the line of white super staples, uh, by Wizards of the Coast, uh, <laughs> subsidiary of Hasbro, uh, we have a card made to sell the commander deck, uh, deep gnome terramancer, one in a white for a gnome wizard. It's a 2-2 with flash. Once again, it has flash, uh, and it's a two drop. Whenever one or more lands enter the battlefield under an opponent's control without being played, so if somebody cracks a fetch land, plays a rampant growth, whatever, you may search your library for a planes card, put it onto the battlefield tap, then shuffle. Do this only once each turn. Oh, man. This card is just so obnoxious. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can get any planes. You can get dual lands. Uh, you can get utility lands. You can get triomes, whatever. Um, your opponents are going to play fetch lands and rampant gross and stuff because that's how they're going to fix their mana. And then you just get a ramp. Uh, yeah, and they can't even like play around it ahead of time because you're just going to flash to send a response. Ugh. I really hate the design of white now. On, like like I said in my white video, and like I said earlier, white was not a bad color for commander. Um, it had some like holes where it could have used some help like card draw and stuff. But if you're smart about building your deck and synergies in your deck, you could definitely make up for it for sure. Um, but people, so many people just went along with what content creators were saying and saying that like white is bad and just, you know, parroting it. So Wizards felt like they had to do something, I believe. And uh, I really hate this direction. It's White's going to be like maybe the second best color in the near future, especially if we get many more cards like these that we've seen in this set. So... Um, I definitely foresee that as a future if this trend continues very much longer at all. Um, you're going to see a lot of this card. This card's going to be expensive um, because this card's made to sell the commander deck uh, just like the other one's made to sell the main set. So you'll be annoyed by this card, trust me. Harper Recruiter, two and a white for a human warrior, three one with flying. 
Whenever this attacks, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a cleric, rogue, warrior, and or wizard card from among them. Put those cards into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This card's cool. Now, this is a card. This is a good way of doing white card draw. Uh, it's an evasive card for a reasonable mana cost um, that requires you to attack to get the value of it. And you get selective value. You can only get specific cards, but it requires you to build a certain way to get that card advantage, which white has been doing this sort of effect for a while. Um, which I like. I think this is a uh, good design. Um, I could, I mean, obviously this is in the party deck, so obviously this is asking you to play party. But realistically, you could play this in like a, you know, one of these other tribes. If you're in like white clerics or warriors, which white definitely can do, then like you could play this card in that deck too. Um, especially warriors, because this itself is a warrior. So I think that's uh, a cool archetype for this card. And I think this card's a, a good design. Um, this card will see play. Uh, outside of just the pre-con, I think. Seasoned Dungeoneer, three and a white for a 3-4 human warrior. Uh, when is the battlefield, you take the initiative. Whenever you attack, target attacking cleric, rogue warrior, or wizard gains protection from creatures till end of turn, it explores. Um, this card's definitely interesting. Uh, one nice thing I like about this card um, is that you don't have to complete the dungeon for any part of this card. The initiative is just good value for you. Uh, and giving your creature, one of your creatures protection from creatures means that you can easily take back the initiative, uh, which is really nice. Uh, it also asks you to build in a certain way. Uh, if it wants you to be in one of the tribes of party, um, which is nice. Once again, you could play this in a white warriors deck too if you wanted to, uh, or clerics, I guess. Uh, and the explorers is, uh, is a really nice upside. It's, uh, you know, pseudo card draw slash card selection. Uh, by the way, I guess I'll mention what exploring does real quick. Exploring is you reveal the top card of your library. Uh, you put it in your hand if it's a land. Otherwise, you put a 1-1 one -one counter on the creature that explored. And then you can either put it back on top of your library or in your graveyard. So if it's a land, you have to obviously reveal that it's a land and then you put it in your hand. Um, but yeah, so if it's a land, you get to draw the card. And if not, you get some card selection. So exploring is really nice. Um, it's good design. Um, this card's cool. I like this card a lot. Stick together, three white, white for a sorcery. Each player chooses a party from among creatures then control, then sacrifices the rest. Uh, they really wanted to use that cute wording. So it also has a separate line of text that tells you what that means. <laughs> that actually explains what the card does. Uh, to choose a party, choose up to one uh, each of cleric, rogue, warrior, and wizard. Um, so you choose four creatures as long as, one, as, long as they're of the party types. Um, yeah, they really just wanted to use this, uh, this wording, which, uh, once you understand what it means, it makes a lot of sense. But when you just read it on its face, uh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, I anticipate usually with, uh, the extended arts of these cards, they typically don't have reminder text. I haven't looked at this one specifically, but I would guess that they probably leave the reminder text on those. If they don't, it's going to be very awkward for some players. That being said, I think this card sees exactly play in uh, the pre-con slash uh, party decks outside of that. Uh, I don't think this is a very good board wipe outside of that. Even if your commander is one of these types and you don't care about the other types very much, I don't foresee you wanting to play this. On to blue. Um, <clears throat> Aboleth Spawn. Two and a blue for a fish horror. It's a 2-3. It has flash, ward 2. Whenever a creature entering the battlefield under an opponent's control causes a triggered ability of that creature to trigger, you may copy that ability and you may choose new targets for the copy. This card's annoying, um, but I don't think this card... Once again, they added flash to this because they just have to add flash to these. Um, <clears throat> and ward 2 so it can protect itself. Um, that being said, uh, this card has pretty specific warding. Uh, it says that the creature that enters has to be the trigger, has to cause the trigger, and it has to be its own trigger. For example, if you um, if your opponent plays a creature and it triggers their Cathar's Crusade or something, you won't get the Cathar's Crusade trigger. If uh, a creature entering the battlefield causes a Guardian Project to trigger, where they get a draw card from the creature entering, you don't get that trigger. It's exactly a effect like if you cast if your opponent casts a Reclamation Sage. When the Reclamation Sage enters, it triggers, and you, they get to blow up an artifact or enchantment because of the Reclamation Sage. In that case, you would get to copy that effect. So this effect is narrow. Um, definitely more narrow than the white cards we've seen in this set. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not good. Um, is it good enough to go in like any blue deck? No, I don't think so. 
Um, but it is good enough to see play in decks that care about basically anything else on this card. Decks that care about like flash tribal decks, fish or horror tribal decks. Um, yeah, anything like that, then you're in for this card for sure. Um, but outside of that, this card will just see mixed play. This card's not as absurd as it as you might initially think when you read it. Um, but this card is definitely going to be annoying because once again, it has flash for some reason. Artificer class, uh, one in a blue for a uh, enchantment class, uh, all the way from the original D and D. The first artifact spell you cast each turn costs one less to cast. That's a nice effect for two mana. Um, not amazing, but it's fine. Um, you can pay one in a blue to level this to level two. Uh, and it says, when this class becomes level two, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal an artifact card. Put that card into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Okay, so for two mana, you get to draw an artifact, which is a nice effect for two mana um, on top of the initial effect. Okay, so those two effects, this card is like moderately playable. Um, then we go to the level three, which is the final mode for five and a blue. You get an effect that says at the beginning of your end step, you create a token. That's a copy of target artifact you control. Six mana is a lot for that effect. That being said, the other two effects are good enough where you could like, you know, convince somebody to play this card or convince me to play this card. So the last effect of when I run out of things to do, I can pay six mana and get uh, a token. That's a copy of something I have is nice. Um, Definitely not why I'm playing this card, though. Um, all that being said, um, this is, once again, a not-artifact card in your artifact deck. So it has to really justify its place. Um, in general, I would say that this probably doesn't justify its place. Um, it doesn't quite do enough for me. Um, it is a nice mana sink. Uh, so it has that going for it. But... Um, Having to pay four mana before you get your card back is kind of tough. Uh, and only discounting your first artifact spell you cast each turn. It's like I can play uh, the Vidalkin that does this. Uh, that does it for every artifact I play. And it's an artifact itself. So, like, yeah. Um, this card seems... a. It doesn't seem tough to justify. But I don't foresee myself playing it. Um, it is a very cool card, though. And I definitely expected to see some play. But for me... As a player that's been playing a long time, um, I have plenty of good non-artifact cards that I want to play in my artifact deck, so doesn't quite make the cut for me. Astral Dragon, 6 blue blue, 8 mana for a dragon. It's a 4-4 four, four with flying. Uh, when this enters the battlefield, you create two token copies. Uh, uh, you, you create two tokens that are copies of target non-creature permanent except they're 3-3 three, three dragons in addition to the other types, and they have flying. Um, so, notably, you only get to target one thing, uh, and it has to be a non-creature, but you get two copies of that one thing. Um, it is kind of annoying that if you target a legendary thing, you only get, like, one of them, because they will become copies of it, meaning that they will have the legend rule, and then you'll have to sack one of them. Um, <clears throat> all that being said... 8 mana is also just way too much to cast for this effect. I mean, technically you get 10 power over 3 creatures, which isn't, like, awful. But, like, nowadays when you're on 8 mana, man, you gotta be winning the game with that card or be doing something obscene. Uh, and this card does definitely not do anything obscene. Uh, it's a pretty fair card. Um, <clears throat> I don't foresee this card seeing play. Um, it's, like, cool and, like, interesting. But the mana cost and the effect are just very, very uh, far off of what Commander usually is nowadays. <clears throat> and the effect's kind of narrow, because uh, you, you can only target non-creatures, so it's not even that flexible. Um, so, you, yeah, it has to have... Uh, it requires, like, setup, and then... Like, any card that's, like, 8 mana requires setup, like... I don't know, I'm already kind of out of... So, yeah, I don't I don't think this card's good. Endless Evil, 2 and a blue for an enchantment aura. Uh, enchant creature you control. At the beginning of your upkeep, create a token that's a copy of enchanted creature, except it's a token... Except the token is a 1-1. One, one. When an enchanted creature dies, if a creature, if that creature was a horror, return Endless Evil to its owner's hand. Uh, okay, so even though this card can technically do something out of horror, outside of Horror Tribal, I, I'm not willing to risk the Omega blowout potential of this card um, outside of Horror Tribal. And even in Horror Tribal, it's like, 
I'm playing a non-horror in my horror tribal, and the payoff is like not really that high. So, because um, you can still get super blown out. Um, so yeah, I this has all the downsides of normal auras, and then some. It doesn't give you immediate value. Um, it doesn't, uh, you know, always. It, it doesn't give you card advantage unless it's like you're putting on exactly a horror, and they don't blow up your horror in response. So yeah, because obviously you're gonna want to put this on your scary horror, right? And then if it's if you're already giving them incentive to blow up your scary card, then they're just gonna two for one you, right? Um, so yeah, I don't think this card is uh, good even in the deck it wants you to play it in. So uh, I don't like this card. Grell Philosopher, two and a blue for a horror wizard. It's a one four. When it enters the battlefield and at the beginning of your upkeep, each horror you control gains all activated abilities of target artifact and opponent controls until end of turn. You may spend blue mana as though it were mana of any color to activate those abilities. Uh, this card's pretty cool um, in your horror tribal deck. Being able to turn all your horrors into like a soul ring or like a, I don't know, a whatever, um, seems pretty sweet. Um, it doesn't shut off their artifacts, so it's not like a feels bad card. Um, but it just, your horrors still stay horrors. They still are their normal cards, but they just get extra abilities. Um yeah, and it still allows you to spend uh, blue mana of any color if you if you copy some cool activated ability of a whatever ability. Um, yeah, I think this card's cool. It's going to see play in Horror Tribal for sure, but obviously not outside of that. Mocking Doppelganger, three and a blue for uh, Shapeshifter. It has flash. It's a zero, zero. Uh, you can have it enter the battlefield as a copy of and a creature and opponent controls, except it has other creatures with the same name as this creature are goaded. I don't think this card's good. Um, Stunt Double and Clones in general are like barely, barely playable uh, in Commander. And the fact that this one can only copy your opponent's creatures is a pretty big downside. Because once again, your opponent's creature, you didn't put your opponent's creatures in your deck, so they're not as likely to synergize with your deck as the cards in your deck are. Um, And the upside of goading the thing that you targeted is like, I guess, man. Uh, yeah, I don't think this card's uh, very playable. I would play it like the vast majority of other clones before I play this card. Um, cool art, though. Psionic Ritual. Four blue blue for a sorcery. Uh, it has Replicate. Tap an untapped horror you control. Uh, replicate me says uh, when you cast the spell, copy it. Each time you paid its Replicate cost, you may choose new targets for the copy. So when you cast this, you can tap your horrors. Uh, and then for each t- horror you tap, you get to do this effect again. Uh, exile target instant or sorcery card from a graveyard. Copy it. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. And then uh, you exile Psionic R- Ritual, this card. Um, obviously, this would only ever go in exactly Horror Tribal. Um, this card's cool, but it's a not horror in your Horror Tribal deck. So it has to have a really good payoff for being able to make it the cut in your deck. Um and is the is the card good enough? Um, I don't think so. Um, I could definitely see situations where it would be good. Uh, it, this will definitely overperform in some games, but in the games that it doesn't do anything in, does Stone Cold nothing outside of like six mana copy or preordain or whatever? I mean, maybe you can snag a demonic tutor, but like six mana demonic tutor, wow. Um, yeah, I don't think this card's good enough. It is cute and cool and will lead to a lot of fun at play experiences from, but from a strictly like, um, you know, optimization standpoint, I don't see it. All right. This one's got a lot of people talking to black market connections Two and a black. So three mana for an enchantment. The beginning of your pre-combat main phase, choose one or more. Uh, you create a to- treasure token and lose one life. Draw a card, lose two life. Create a 3-2 colorless shapeshifter creature token with changeling, lose three life. Okay. Um, my stance on this card. I'm not big on Phyrexian Arena in general, which is the first obvious comparison to this card. I play Phyrexian Arena in like a limited number of decks. I play it in like slow, grindy, value-based decks. Or decks that aren't going to win very fast. Um, and even in those decks... Um, I have to be in like not blue uh, because at like that point I can probably just draw more cards than 
for Exxon Arena can uh, instantly uh, that rather than overtime like for Exxon Arena does. Um, <clears throat> but what I do like about this card is it uh, helps get you your mana back for taking the turn off like you do with this card in for Exxon Arena. The turn you play this does Stone Cold nothing because uh, this triggers on your pre-combat main phase, which you obviously you're in when you cast this card. Um, and then Phyrexian Arena does the same thing. It triggers in your upkeep. So it does stone nothing the turn you play it. But this one at least lets you get your uh, mana back slowly by creating a treasure each turn if you want to. Um, and then the draw card mode I'm obviously interested in too. So what I'm in for on this card is paying three life a turn to make a treasure and draw a card. Um, that can add up fairly quickly, um, but I'm willing to do that. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm willing to do that for sure. Um but it, this card is definitely not playable in every black deck to me. Um, the last mode is almost nothing to me. Um, I mean, if you're in a tribal deck, like, okay, I guess making a changeling is, like, fine sometimes. But three life for that is is a lot of life. Once you start doing all of these modes, paying six life a turn, whew, that adds up pretty deep, or, or pretty quickly, uh, and can put you into some deep trouble. Um, if you've ever played Sylvan Library... Uh, then you know what I'm talking about. But Sylvan Library is infinitely better than this card. Um, so yeah, I, for me, it's like I would look at this card in the same decks I would look at with Phyrexian Arena. Slow, grindy decks. Um, decks that don't have access to um, like slow, consistent card draw over a long game. Um, so not blue, basically. Uh, yeah, uh, it definitely is uh, not extremely widely applicable like uh people think um but this is another card that's obviously made to sail commander decks funny thing they put it in the same deck as the as the stupid gnome <laughs> uh so that deck is obviously going to sell like infinitely more than all the other ones um yeah i think this card is like good to find um yeah i don't think it's i don't think it's better than phyrexian arena i think it's like the same it offers like a different uh scale of uh you know, you have to invest more life into it, but you get a little bit more out of it. Uh, being a treasure token, generally. Pay three life, draw a card, make a treasure token. Um, which can be nice, but uh, you can also... If you're in a slow granny game, then obviously you can put yourself in a hole uh, quicker than you do with Phyrexian Arena. So, um, yeah. This card's, like, good, but... Far from broken, far from playable in every black deck. Um, yeah. That's my kind of... That's kind of my piece on black market connections. Brain Stealer Dragon. Five black black for a dragon whore. Oh, it looks so sweet too. Uh, it's a 6-6 six, six flyer. At the beginning of your end step, exile the top card of each opponent's library. You may play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. If a spell is cast this way, you may spend mana as though or mana of any color to cast it. Whenever a non-land permanent an opponent owns enters the battlefield under your control, they lose life equal to its mana value. Um, I like this card. Uh, it gets you immediate value. The turn you the turn you play it, you go to your end step. You get to uh, draw three cards. Um, and uh, if this stays around, then uh, which it doesn't have to to cast or play the cards you exile, which is nice. But if it does stay around, uh, it pays you off for playing those cards by hurting your opponents uh, when you play them. So I think this card's cool. It is mana intensive, obviously. Seven mana is a lot of mana for this card. Um. And it, I, I'm probably only going to feel good about this card if I hit, get real lucky and hit something sweet off my opponent's library or I get to untap with this, um, like, more than once. Uh, so, that being said, um, this card's not stellar or anything, but it is really fun. If you like playing your opponent's cards, you'll probably like this card. Solemn Doom Guide. Three black black for a tiefling cleric. It's a 4-5 with flying. Each creature card in your graveyard that's a cleric, rogue, warrior, and or wizard has unearthed for one and a black. And uh, for a reminder, unearth is uh, return this cr the creature to the battlefield. That creature gains haste, and then you exile at the beginning of the next end step, or if it would leave the battlefield. And you can only unearth as a sorcery. Um, okay, so unearth is a very, very good ability. And two mana to unearth uh, anything is a very, very efficient rate. Um, that being said, this creature, as a creature, as a body itself, sucks. Uh, five mana for a four or five flyer with no other keywords is uh, not a great, uh, not a great body. Um, but this is a cleric, so this will help count towards your uh, your cleric, uh, you know, tribal deck or your because um, cleric decks are usually white black, 
or it will count well or it will count towards your party which is nice um but yeah i definitely foresee this card seeing play this card will see play in clerics uh it will see play in uh this in uh uh party um yeah this effect is very powerful even though the body sucks on this card um yeah this effect is very powerful two mana to unearth uh anything um that's of the tribe it's uh is a very powerful effect do not sleep on it uh not gonna try very hard to pronounce this name uchalon sure uh three and a black for a crab ooze horror it's a star four its power is equal to the number of crabs oozes and or horrors you control uh at the beginning of your end step exile up to one target creature from an opponent's graveyard if you do you create a token that's a copy of this card um this card's like cool but I would probably only play this in exactly uh, the tribes that it asks you. Crabs, oozes, or horrors. Obviously, horrors is the, the flavor of this deck, so it makes sense here. Uh, once again, incidental graveyard hate is really nice. Uh, and then you get more graveyard hate as the turns go on. Uh, and it happens at your end step, so you immediately get to exile the most relevant thing in a graveyard. Um, uh, being a creature, of course. Um, yep, I think this card's playable in these tribes, for sure. From the Catacombs, three black black for a sorcery. Return target creature card from a graveyard to the battlefield with a corpse counter on it. If that creature would leave the battlefield, exile instead of putting it anywhere else, uh, you take the initiative, and then you can escape it for three black black, escape, exile five other cards from your graveyard. So escape basically allows you to cast from your graveyard by paying the mana and exiling the number of cards other than this from your graveyard. So this is a recurrable uh, reanimation card. Um, but you can't keep recurring the same thing. So the thing that you recur uh, will get exiled whenever it leaves. Um, taking the initiative when you cast this is uh, nice too. Um, it will give you the initiative initially. <laughs> uh, and also it gives you a way to bring it to get the initiative back without having to attack by just recasting this card. All that being said, uh, five mana is uh, quite a bit for this card. Exiling five other cards from your graveyard will help eat your graveyard, so that way you're unlikely to be consistently randoming things out of your graveyard. Because you'll have to probably start feeding them to this and able to keep recasting it with escape. Um, but yeah, five mana for a recursive uh, reanimation spell that can't keep getting back the same thing. Um, overall, I don't think this card's worth it. Um, two mana intensive. Ask you to exile too many cards from your graveyard to do it. Taking the initiative is a nice touch, but... Um, not worth it enough, and the 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 best things that you reanimate, uh, you can't reanimate more than more than once because they get exiled. So, I don't think this card is uh, playable. It is cool design though. All right, we're almost we're getting real close. Uh, we're at the red cards now. Uh, bothersome Quasit, sure. Uh, two and a red for a demon. It's a three two with menace. Uh, goaded creatures your opponent's control can't block. Uh, that's actually pretty nice. Uh, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, go target creature and opponent controls. Wow, any non-creature spell. each Every single non-creature spell goads something. And then they can't block as well. Wow. Uh, this helps facilitate damage for you on your opponents. Also protects you from their threats. Um, triggers a ton. Any non-creature triggers this. I could see this making the cut in Spellslinger. Because Spellslinger typically doesn't um, commit to the board a lot. So you don't always have a lot of defenses. Um, works well in goad decks and offensive decks decks that want to control the board by goading um, this card just does a lot of things I think this card's quite good um, simply put can go a lot of different archetypes this card will see play death kiss 5 and a red for a 5-5 five five beholder whenever a creature an opponent controls attacks one of your opponents double its power until end of turn interesting uh, X, X, and a red with, uh, it has monstrosity X. So for each, uh, mana you spend into the X, it, uh, gets a one, one counter. And then also when it becomes monstrous. So when you use that ability, uh, go up to X target creatures, your opponent's control. Uh, so for X, X, red, it gets bigger and then you get to go some stuff. Okay. Whenever a creature an opponent controls attacks, one of your opponents double its power until end of turn. That's a pretty good incentive to already make your opponents just attack each other without goading them. Um, but the goad is uh helps force the action on it too so um that being said uh six mana for a five five is like uh, that's that's pretty awful stats 
Uh, notably, it will become a 10-5 when it attacks your opponent. So, I mean, like, that's something. But I only really see this in the Go Tribal deck because your opponents are going to be fairly low on defenders um, since, uh, you know, then maybe this 10-5 can actually get in there. Um, and it helps your game plan get going of your opponents killing each other by goading them and forcing them to attack. Um, so yeah, I don't think this card's going to see a lot of play. It's just going to see play in like the go decks like this precon basically, and maybe some other, uh, decks that are inspired by the precon or are similar. Delayed blast fireball, one red, red for an instant. Uh, it deals two damage to each opponent and each creature they control. This spell is cast from exile. It deals five damage to each opponent and each creature they control instead. Uh, and it has foretell for a four red red. So you can pay two mana to exile this, and then you pay its foretell cost to cast it from exile uh, for on a later turn. Um, okay. <clears throat> Three mana to deal two damage to Pyroclasm. Your opponents is like, fine. It's not very good. Um, dealing five damage, however, that's, that's a pretty good chunk. Uh, and it also deals it to your opponents, which is uh, not irrelevant. However, the uh, the foretell cost of this card is way too high. You have to go in eight mana for that effect. Two up front and then six when you actually want to cast it. Um, being an instant is nice. Um, so, okay, where am I at with this card? For me, this card, you have to cast it from exile without its foretell cost. Uh, you have to have some other effect that allows you to cast it from exile, whether it's Jessica's Will or whatever. Because then you uh, pay three mana for this card, but then you get its exile effect. Um, so you get a massive discount on the... Uh, rather than paying its foretell cost um so yeah to me it seems like this card goes in like in decks that are the precon or are similar to the precon like prosper or whatever cards that are uh, care about playing your deck from exile impulse drawing and stuff uh and that also allows you to cast them from exile and stuff so um yeah for me i'm only interested in playing this card if i can very reliably cast this for three mana and get the five damage otherwise this card sucks um, so for that reason, I think this card is uh, pretty narrow, and we'll only see decks uh, similar to the precon. Loot dispute three and a red for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you take the initiative and create a treasure token. Whenever you attack the player who has the initiative, you create a treasure token. Whenever you complete a dungeon, you create a five-five red dragon creature token with flying. Um, I think this card sucks. Four mana uh, to get a treasure and the initiative is like not worth it on its own uh, getting a treasure getting a single treasure um when you attack the player with the initiative it's like i mean i guess you kind of already want to attack the player with the initiative um but if you already have the initiative you can't generate more treasure so like and just keeping the initiative is like it was like fine but like not insane uh and then the only thing you the only other effect you get is you can make a dragon five five token uh, when you complete a dungeon, which is like, I guess, like, I'd much rather, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of gravy if the rest of the card was really good. Um, but the rest of this card is not good. Uh, I don't foresee this card seeing play. It's not good, uh, really in your dungeon decks. <clears throat> I don't think, uh, it's not good enough in your treasure decks and it's not good, uh, in caring about the initiative. Um, so yeah, all the modes are mediocre, uh, and they don't all add up to be enough. To me i don't think this card's good <clears throat> now fishing sure <laughs> uh five and a red for a four six beast demon with some trippy ass art uh it flies uh whenever you cast a spell from exile copy it you may choose new targets for the copy if it's a permanent spell the copy gains haste and at the beginning of the end step sacrifice this permanent um I actually consider that this, the second part of that, where the permanent gets haste and you have to sacrifice at the end of the turn so you don't get to keep it. Uh, to me, that's actually upside. Um, I, I actually like that better than just keeping the permanent forever. Uh, unless it's like, you know, uh, a, a mana rock or whatever, then obviously I'd rather keep it. But um, but yeah, I think this card is uh, pretty scary um, outside of just the art. Um, <laughs> obviously, you want to play this in exactly a deck that casts things uh, from exile. But when you do, man, copying all that stuff is, that's pretty crazy. Uh, so yeah, for that reason, I think this goes very well in the decks that are similar to the precon. Um, but outside of that, this card won't see play. But uh, it is scary for sure. And the art is scary. Spectacular Showdown. One in a red for a sorcery. 
Put a double strike counter on target creature, then goad each creature that had a double strike counter put on it. Uh, and it has that weird wording because it has overload for four red, red, red. Um, which means you can put a double strike counter on every creature and goad every creature. Um, okay. This card has uh, more flexibility than it seems. You could just play this in like a keywords matter deck. Um, just two mana to give your creature double strike is like good um, to get it permanently. It's not bad. Um, but the overload cost for this is obviously where it gets really interesting, right? It adds a lot of interesting play. Um, if you if your opponent if you have an opponent that's mostly open, uh, where you can overload this uh, before you attack, uh, then obviously that's ideal. Then you can get in there and your opponents can absolutely murder each other um but the person to your left is gonna get absolutely rolled uh, if they don't kill people when they untap um because <laughs> they're open target for the player after them and then the player after them but <clears throat> then you got to think after after all that happens and then after everybody goes around the table who's ever left you get to untap and almost all their stuff is tapped out and then you still have all your double striking idiots that you had last turn so um yeah this card's definitely very scary this card will definitely see play um this is gonna create for some crazy scenarios in games um and it will make your opponents beat the tar out of each other uh so yeah for that reason this card's hilarious and we'll see play <laughs> all right green cards we're almost done almost done uh two and a green uh this is green slime two and a green for an ooze is a two two with flash they love flash this set apparently uh when green slime enters the battlefield Counter target activated or triggered ability from an artifact or an enchantment source. If, it a, per if a permanent ability is countered this way, destroy that permanent. Um, that's all like fine, but most importantly, this has foretell for just a green mana. So you pay two generic to foretell this, and then on a later turn, you can pay a green mana to cast this from exile. Just one green mana. <clears throat> uh, and obviously, this is asking you to foretell anyway because it wants you to do it instant speed in response to the activated or triggered ability. Um, this card's definitely going to see play. I think this card's good. Um, only having to only hold up one green mana to cast this is, is a uh, very, very doable. Uh, it blows up the thing of the ability it counters. So it gets rid of their trigger and it kills the thing. So you don't have to deal with it anymore. Um, this card definitely sees playable for sure. Uh, the only downside to this card is it seems kind of hard to, um loop this card like uh usually effects like this like rex sage and stuff you want them to die so you can bring them back and do it again um but this card is much harder to to do that effect with because it's much harder to reanimate at instant speed in response to something so for that reason this card is not going to be like super widespread play um but i think this card is good um and has a really nice effect uh and the mana cost for it is is very reasonable um, so yeah, this card will see play, but it's not, uh, insane or anything. Journey to the Lost City, three and a green for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top four cards of your library, and then you roll a d20. If you roll a one through nine, you put a land card from among them onto the battlefield. If you roll a 10 through 19, you create a two, two wolf creature token and put a one on encounter on each creature among those cards. Put it, put it for on it for each creature card among those cards. Okay. <clears throat> so you if you roll 10 through 19 you don't get any of the cards but you get to make a wolf and then you put a woman count on for each creature in that that you exiled okay 20 put all permanent cards exile with journey to the lost city onto the battlefield then sacrifice it <clears throat> so the one through nine mode is like interesting because at least it ramps you and it puts the land into play untapped which is nice the 10 through 19 mode is awful uh, i don't want to hit that mode uh and then the 20 mode uh obviously you'll very rarely hit it but that mode is obviously good um and you get to get the old cards that you exiled with it, notably, because as long as it, as long as this car, card hasn't died, uh, and you still have the cards that you exiled with it over like a few turns or whatever, you get to put all of them onto the battlefield, all the permanents, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> but this doesn't do anything with instant or sorceries. Um, you are very likely to whiff only exiling the top four cards of your library, um, and the cards stay in exile, so you can't get them back with regrowth or something. So if you accidentally hit a card you don't want to hit. Uh, like an important creature or enchantment or something like that, then it's just stuck there because uh, you're probably not going to hit a 20 with this card. So for all those reasons combined, I don't think this card's good. Um, it's interesting, but I think this card sucks. Tlin Kali Hunter 
sure. Uh, it's five and a green green for a scorpion scout. Wow, what a creature type to go with the name. Uh, seven seven with trample. Once each turn, you may pay zero rather than pay the mana cost for a creature spell you cast from exile. Very specific warding, um, but definitely really nice for uh, the, a deck where you're going to consistently cast things from exile. And this also has an adventure, uh, Retrieve Prey. It's a one and a green for a sorcery. Exile target creature card from your graveyard. Until end of turn, you may cast that card. Um, wow, this card's uh, very cool. I really like the two mana mode on this card. Um, especially in conjunction with the main mode. Notably, you would need nine mana to cast both in the same turn to allow you to play the card you exiled for free uh, with the main card. Um, that being said, it's still very possible you could get a mana discount in that exchange. Uh, because if you're already paying seven, like what's waiting two more mana, right? Um, but yeah, the two mana mode is uh, decent. It's, uh, you know, allows you to get, it's like a weird regrowth effect. So it's not nothing. And if your deck cares about casting things from exile, then it's upside over a regrowth. Um, yeah, this card's interesting in the exile sort of matters deck. Um, but outside of that, I don't see it seeing a lot of play. But uh, it's definitely a good enough card for those decks. Venture Forth, three and a green for a sorcery. Uh, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a land card. Put that card onto the battlefield and then the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Exile Venture Forth with three time counters on it. And this has suspend three for one and a green. Um, so this is another one in the cycle that will cast itself and then resuspend itself. Um, I don't suspend three is tough uh, for this and the other cards of this cycle. Um, because just getting one land off of this, notably the land does enter untapped and I can get any land, which is cool. Um, but yeah, the mana the mana for this card is just not a rate that I'm willing to pay um, or wait on. So I would want to care about playing the card from Exile, uh, which is obviously why it's in the Exile Tribal deck. Um, but outside of that narrow circumstance, uh, I don't think this card's good enough to see like widespread play uh, in green decks or anything. Um, interesting card though. Multi-class Baldric, one mana for an equipment. Uh, equipped creature has life link if you control a rogue. Death touch if you control. Oh, sorry, life link if you control a cleric. Death touch if you control a rogue. Haste if you control a warrior. And flying if you control a wizard. As long as you have a full party, prevent all damage that would be dealt to equipped creature and has equipped two. Um, <clears throat> okay. So for me, the main question that would make me interested in this card is, uh, if I don't have a full party, is this card playable? Uh, lifelink if I control a cleric. Um, that's like fine. Uh, one mana and two to equip to give a creature lifelink is like obviously not very efficient, but like it's passable. Uh, death touch if you control a rogue. I don't care about that mode at all. Uh, is like at least as far as standalone. Uh, haste if you control a warrior. Um, that's like decent. Flying if you control a wizard, also decent. So three of the four uh, effects are like decent. And then death touch is like the worst, but it's like can be passable. But then if you give it death touch, you want to block with it more if you don't have a full party and then you lose like a party member probably. So um, it's a little awkward without a full party for sure. Uh, and then as long as you have a full party, preventing all damage that would be dealt to a equipped creature is like cool it doesn't say combat damage uh so it'll protect your creature from a blasphemous act but then you won't have party anymore um <laughs> so yeah there's that um because all your other party members will die obviously um i is this card good enough so i don't think this card's good enough outside of a party deck i think i've reached that conclusion is this card good enough for a party deck i don't think so um because what what is your totality of what you get? Lifelink, Death Touch, Haste Flying. Okay, that's cool. Um, but not like I'm not like head over heels over that with having to work hard enough to put my party together as it is. And then the preventing all damage that would be dealt to a equipped creature is like okay, I guess. But yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not in for this card. Um, not in a party deck. Not outside of a party deck. I don't think this card's good enough. Uh, even though the mana cost is low and the equip is like somewhat low, uh, the totality of all these effects, uh, I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze on this. Saravox Tome, four mana for an artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you take the initiative. Uh, you can tap to make a colorless mana. If you have the initiative, you can tap for two colorless mana. 
Uh, pay three, tap. Exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Activate if you've, only if you've completed a dungeon. Okay. Um, this card is uh, very bad if you have not completed a dungeon. Uh, a four mana artifact that taps for one mana and then two the turn you play it because you'll get the initiative um, is very bad. Um, even four mana, even if this was just four mana tap for two colorless mana, I'm not in for that effect outside of like exactly a colorless deck. Um, and then the last mode is when this card actually gets a little interesting. Um, because if you've, if you've completed a dungeon, it's like somewhat likely that you'll still have the initiative. Um, so then this will tap for two mana or you can pay the, uh, it, so that's at least good. Um. But then paying three and exile cards on top of your library until exile non link card and casting it for free. Um, that effect's nice, but like with how bad this card is, um, yeah, this card's definitely not playable outside of exactly uh, a dungeon deck. And even then, I'm like, uh, I'm skeptical for sure. Um, because you can hit any non link card. So when you hit your rampant growth, it's like, okay, I put like four slash five mana into this by tapping this and tapping three mana. And all I got was this rampant growth. Like, sure, that's like card advantage, but like, not not when you're in this far into the game. Does that actually matter? Um, so yeah, this card can even still whiff since it can hit anything in your deck. So, mm, yeah, I don't think this card's good. We did it, everybody. We did it. We made it to the end. We talked about all the relevant cards, all the rares, all the mythic rares, and Commander Legends. Uh, once again, uh, the legendaries uh, backgrounds can uh, choose a background commanders, multicolor commanders. They're all in other videos. I'll link those two videos in the description. But thank you. Thank you for hanging out with me. Um, a lot of work's put into this. My voice is shot. My throat hurts. Uh, so please do the algorithm stuff to show your appreciation. Uh, but yeah, I still appreciate you. Uh, thanks for sticking with me to the end. And I hope you all have an excellent day. Cheers.